Rich dads increase your financial IQ. We want you to be rich and then take a look at what has happened since then. I'd say we knew what we were talking about. Robert is taking you one step further with Rich Dads Increase Your Financial IQ and I have every reason to believe he will be as prescient as we were in 2006. I would advise you to pay attention to what he has to say. Robert and I have shared concerns and we have traveled similar paths as teachers and businessmen. Both of us had rich dads who helped to shape our lives, our spirits, and our many successes. We are both entrepreneurs and real estate investors, and we are successful because we had financial education. We know its importance and are serious when it comes to financial literacy. Robert has said, it's financial education that enables people to process financial information and turn it into knowledge. And most people don't have the financial education they need to take charge of their lives. I couldn't agree more. One thing I noticed immediately about Robert is that he is not complacent. He's very successful already because he loves what he's doing. That's another thing we have in common. That's fortunate for you because he has a lot of very good advice to give. As I said in Why We Want You to Be Rich, what's the point of having great knowledge and keeping it to yourself? Robert answers that question with every book he writes, and you're lucky he's sharing it with you. One of the first steps to getting richer by getting smarter with your money is to take advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. Right now, you are holding a great opportunity. My advice to you is to listen to Rich Dad's Increase Your Financial IQ and to pay attention. You will be on the right path to financial freedom and on the right path to big success. By the way, don't forget to think big. We'll see you in the winner's circle. Author's Note Money is not evil. One of the greatest failures of the educational system is the failure to provide financial education to students. Educators seem to think that money has some sort of taint to it, believing that the love of money is the root of all evil. As most of us know, it is not the love of money that is evil, it is the lack of money that causes evil. It is working at a job we hate that is evil. Working hard, yet not earning enough to provide for our families, is evil. For some, being deeply in debt is evil. Fighting with people you love over money is evil. Being greedy is evil. And committing criminal or immoral acts to get money is evil. Money by itself is not evil. Money is just money. The lack of financial education also causes people to do stupid things or be misled by stupid people. For example, in 1997, when I first published Rich Dad, Poor Dad and stated that your house is not an asset, your house is a liability, howls of protest went up. My book and I were severely criticized. Many self-proclaimed financial experts attacked me in the media. Ten years later, in 2007, as the credit markets crumbled and millions of people were in financial freefall, many losing their homes, some declaring bankruptcy, others owing more on their house than it was worth as real estate dropped in value, these individuals painfully found out that their homes are indeed liabilities, not assets. Today, many financial experts continue to recommend work hard, save money, get out of debt, live below your means, and invest in a well-diversified portfolio of mutual funds. The problem with this advice is that it is bad advice. The rules of money have changed. Today, there is a new capitalism. Saving money, getting out of debt, and diversifying worked in the era of old capitalism. Those who follow the work hard and save money mantra of old capitalism will struggle financially in the era of new capitalism. It is this author's opinion that the lack of financial education in our school systems is a shame. In today's world, financial education is absolutely essential for survival, regardless of whether we are rich or poor, smart or not smart. As most of us know, we now live in the information age. 
Without financial education, people cannot process information into useful knowledge. Without financial knowledge, people struggle financially. Without financial knowledge, people do things such as buy a house and think their home is an asset. Or save money, not realizing that since 1971, their money is no longer money, but a currency. Or do not know the difference between good debt and bad debt. Or why the rich earn more, yet pay less in taxes. Or why the richest investor in the world, Warren Buffett, does not diversify. Without financial knowledge, people look for someone to tell them what to do. And what most financial experts recommend is to save money, get out of debt, live below your means, and invest in a well-diversified portfolio of mutual funds. Like lemmings simply following their leader, they race for the cliff and leap into the ocean of financial uncertainty, hoping they can swim to the other side. This audiobook will not tell you what to do. This audiobook is not about financial advice. This audiobook is about your becoming financially smarter so you can process your own financial information and find your own path to financial nirvana. In sum, this audiobook is about becoming richer by becoming smarter. This audiobook is about increasing your financial IQ. Introduction does money make you rich? The answer is no. Money alone does not make you rich. We all know people who go to work every day but fail to become richer. Ironically, many only grow deeper in debt with each dollar they earn. A friend of mine is a golfing fanatic. He spends thousands of dollars a year on new clubs and every new golf gadget that comes to market. The problem is he will not spend a dime on golf lessons. Hence, his golf game remains the same, even though he has the latest and greatest in golf equipment. If he invested his money in golf lessons and used last year's clubs, he might be a much better golfer. The same nutty phenomenon occurs in the game of money. Billions of people invest their hard-earned money in assets such as stocks and real estate, but invest almost nothing in information. Hence, their financial scores remain about the same. This audiobook is not a get-rich-quick book or a book about some magic formula. This audiobook is about increasing your financial intelligence, your financial IQ. It is about getting richer by getting smarter. It is about the five basic financial intelligences that are required to grow richer, regardless of what the economy, stock, or real estate markets are doing. This audiobook is also about the new rules of money, rules that changed in 1971. One of the reasons why so many people are struggling financially is because they continue to operate according to the old rules of money. Old rules such as work hard, save money, invest for the long term in a well-diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. This audiobook is about playing by the new rules of money, but to do so requires increasing your financial intelligence and your financial IQ. Many people believe that it takes money to make money. This is not true. Ultimately, it is not gold, stocks, real estate, hard work, or money that makes you rich. It is what you know about gold, stocks, real estate, hard work, and money that makes you rich. Ultimately, it is your financial intelligence, your financial IQ that makes you rich. Chapter 1 what is financial intelligence? My poor dad had money problems all his life. No matter how much money he made, his problem was not enough money. Being from the world of academics, he did his best to push his financial problems aside and dedicate his life to a higher cause than money. He did his best to assert that money did not matter, even when it did. He was a great man, a great husband and father, and a brilliant educator, yet it was this thing called money that often called the shots, silently hounded him, and, sadly toward the end, was the measure he used to evaluate his life. As smart as he was, he never solved his money problems. My rich dad, who began to teach me about money at the age of nine, also had money problems. He solved his money problems differently than my poor dad. 
He acknowledged that money did matter, and he strove to increase his financial intelligence at every chance. To him, that meant tackling his money problems head-on and learning from the process. My rich dad was not nearly as academically smart as my poor dad, but because he increased his financial intelligence, my rich dad's money problem was too much money. Having two dads, one rich and one poor, I learned that rich or poor, we all have money problems. The money problems of the poor are not having enough money, using credit to supplement money shortages, the rising cost of living, paying more in taxes the more they make, fear of emergencies, bad financial advice, not enough retirement money. The money problems of the rich are having too much money, needing to keep it safe and invested, not knowing whether people like them or their money, needing smarter financial advisors, raising spoiled kids, estate and inheritance planning, excessive government taxes. One of my favorite commercials is for a financial services company and starts with the rapper M.C. Hammer dancing with beautiful women, a Bentley in a Ferrari and an oversized mansion behind him. In the background, high-end specialty goods are being moved into the mansion. M.C. Hammer's one-hit wonder, You Can't Touch This, is playing as all this is happening. Then the screen goes black and displays the words, 15 minutes later. The next scene is M.C. Hammer sitting on a curb in front of the same ridiculous mansion, his head in his hands, next to a sign that reads, Foreclosed. The announcer says, Life comes at you fast. We're here to help. The world is full of M.C. Hammers. We all have heard of lottery winners who win millions and then are deeply in debt a few years later. Or the young professional athlete who lives in a mansion while he is playing and then lives under a bridge once his playing days are over. Or the young rock star who is a multi-millionaire in his twenties and looking for a job in his thirties. Money alone does not solve your money problems. Hard work does not solve money problems. The world is filled with hard-working people who have no money to show for it. Hard-working people who earn money yet grow deeper in debt, needing to work even harder for even more money. Education does not solve money problems. The world is filled with highly educated poor people. A job does not solve money problems. For many people, the letters J-O-B stand for just over broke. There are millions who earn just enough to survive but cannot afford to live. Many people with jobs cannot afford their own home, adequate health care, education, or even set aside enough money for retirement. What solves money problems? Financial intelligence solves money problems. Some examples of very common money problems are I don't earn enough money. I'm deeply in debt. I have $10,000. What should I invest in? My child wants to go to college, but we don't have the money. I don't have enough money for retirement. I don't like my job, but I can't afford to quit. I'm retired and I'm running out of money. When I was a young boy, Rich Dad said to me, money problems make you smarter if you solve the problem. If you do not solve your money problem, that problem often grows into more problems. If you want to increase your financial intelligence, you need to be a problem solver. Rich Dad used the example of having a toothache to illustrate what he meant by a problem leading to other problems. He said, having a money problem is like having a toothache. If you do not handle the toothache, the toothache makes you feel bad. If you feel bad, you may not do well at work because you are irritable. Not fixing the toothache can lead to further medical complications because it is easy for germs to breed and spread from your mouth. One day you lose your job because you have been missing work due to your chronic illness. Without a job, you cannot pay your rent. If you fail to solve the problem of rent money, you are on the street, homeless, in poor health, eating out of garbage cans, and you still have the toothache. While an extreme example, that story stayed with me. 
I realized at a young age the importance of solving problems and the domino effect caused from not solving a problem. Many people do not solve their financial problems when they are small and at the toothache stage. For example, when short of money, many people use their credit cards to cover the shortfall. Soon they have credit card bills piling up and creditors hounding them for payment. To solve the problem, they take out a home equity loan to pay off their credit cards. The problem is they keep using the credit cards. Now they have a home equity mortgage to pay off and more credit cards. To solve this credit problem, they get new credit cards to pay off the old credit cards. Soon they cannot pay their mortgage or their credit cards and decide to declare bankruptcy. The trouble with declaring bankruptcy is that the root of the problem is still there, just like the toothache. Rather than address the root of the problem, spending habits in this case, many ignore the problem. If you don't pull a weed up by the root and only cut off the top, it will come back quicker and bigger. The same is true for your financial problems. While these examples may seem extreme, they are not uncommon. The point is that financial problems are a problem, but they are a solution as well. If people solve problems, they get smarter. Their financial IQ goes up. Once smarter, they can now solve bigger problems. If they can solve bigger financial problems, they get richer. The Cause of Poverty Poverty is caused by a person's being overwhelmed by problems he or she can't solve. Not all causes of poverty are financial problems. They can be problems like drug addiction, marrying the wrong person, living in a crime-ridden neighborhood, not having job skills, not having transportation to get to work, or not affording health care. Some of today's financial problems, such as excessive debt and low wages, are caused by circumstances beyond an individual's ability to solve, problems that have more to do with our government and a smoke-and-mirrors economy. For example, one of the causes of low wages is high-paying manufacturing jobs moving overseas. Today there are plenty of jobs, but they are in the service sector, not manufacturing. When I was a kid, General Motors was the nation's largest employer. Today, Walmart is the nation's biggest employer. We all know that Walmart isn't known for its high-paying jobs or its generous pensions. Fifty years ago, it was possible for a person without much education to do well financially. Even if you had only a high school degree, a young person could get a relatively high-paying job manufacturing cars or steel. Today, it's manufacturing burgers. Fifty years ago, the manufacturing companies provided health care and retirement benefits. Today, millions of workers are earning less while at the same time needing more money to cover their own medical expenses and save enough for retirement. Every day these financial problems are not solved, they grow bigger and they stem from a larger national problem that is beyond the power of the individual to change or solve. They stem from poor economic policies and cronyism. The rules of money have changed. In 1971, President Nixon took us off the gold standard. This was a poor economic policy that changed the rules of money. It is one of the biggest financial changes in the history of the world, yet few people are aware of this change and its effect on the world economy today. One of the reasons so many people are struggling financially today is because of Nixon's actions. In 1971, the U.S. dollar died because it was no longer money. It became a currency. There is a big difference between money and currency. The word currency comes from the word current, like an electrical or an ocean current. The word means movement. In overly simple terms, a currency needs to keep moving. If it stops moving, it rapidly loses value. If the loss of value is too great, people stop accepting it. If people stop accepting it, the value of the currency plummets to zero. Historically, all currencies eventually go to zero. Throughout history, governments have printed currencies. During the Revolutionary War, the U.S. government printed a currency known as the Continental. It was not long before this currency went to zero. 
After World War I, the German government printed a currency in hopes of paying its bills. Inflation exploded, and the German middle class had its savings wiped out. In 1933, frustrated and broke, the German people elected Adolf Hitler to power in the hopes he would solve their financial problems. Also in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt created Social Security to solve the money problems of the American people. Although very popular, Social Security and Medicare are about to erupt into massive financial problems. If the U.S. government prints more funny money, that is, currency, to solve these two massive financial problems, the value of the U.S. dollar will die faster, and the financial problem will get bigger. This is not a future problem. It is happening now. According to a recent report by Bloomberg, the U.S. dollar has lost 13.2 percent of its purchasing power since George W. Bush took office in January 2001. When the rules of money changed in 1971, savers became losers and debtors became winners. A new form of capitalism emerged. Today, when I hear people saying "You need to save more money" or "Save for retirement," I wonder if the person realizes that the rules of money have changed. Under the old rules of capitalism, it was financially smart to save money. But in the new capitalism, it's financial insanity to save a currency. It makes no sense to park your currency. A currency's purpose is to acquire assets, assets that are either appreciating in value or producing cash flow. A currency must move quickly to acquire real assets with real value, because the currency itself is rapidly declining in value. Another change in the rules of money. Another change in the rules of money occurred in 1974. Prior to 1974, businesses took care of an employee's retirement. They guaranteed the retiree a paycheck for as long as the retiree lived. As you probably already know, that is not the case any longer. Pension plans that pay an employee for life are called defined benefit or DB pension plans. Today, very few companies offer these plans. They are simply too expensive. After 1974, a new type of pension plan emerged: the defined contribution (DC) plan. Today, such plans are known as 401ks, IRAs, KIOs, etc. Simply put, a DC plan has no guarantee of a paycheck for life. You only get back what you and your employer contribute, if you and your employer contribute anything. The newspaper USA Today found in a survey that the greatest fear in America today is not terrorism, but the fear of running out of money during retirement, and the fear is valid. The U.S. education system doesn't equip its citizens with the financial knowledge required to successfully invest for retirement. If schools teach anything about money, they teach kids to pick a few mutual funds and pay bills on time. Hardly enough financial education to handle the financial problems we face. Beyond that, most people don't realize that the rules of money have changed, and that if they are savers, they are losers. That the rules of money have changed, that those changes make you poorer, and that they are out of your control may seem unfair, and it is. The key to becoming rich is to recognize that the system is unfair, learn the rules, and use them to your advantage. How the poor handle money problems. When it came to describing the poor, Rich Dad said, "The poor see money problems only as problems. Many feel they are victims of money. They think that if they had more money, their money problems would be over. Little do they know that their attitude towards money problems is the problem. Their inability to solve or avoidance of them only prolongs their money problems and makes them bigger. Instead of becoming richer, they become poorer." Instead of increasing their financial IQ, the only thing the poor increase is their financial problems. How the middle class handle money problems. While the poor are the victims of money, the middle class are prisoners of money. In describing the middle class, Rich Dad said, "The middle class solve their money problems differently. Instead of solving the money problem, they think they can outsmart their money problems." 
the middle class will spend money to go to school so they can get a secure job. Most are smart enough to earn money and put up a firewall, a buffer zone between them and their money problems. They buy a house, climb the corporate ladder, and save for retirement by buying stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. They believe their academic or professional education is enough to insulate them from the cruel, harsh world of money. At the age of 50, said Rich Dad, many middle-aged people discover that they are a prisoner in their own office. Many are valued employees. They have experience. They earn enough money and have enough job security. Yet deep down they know they are trapped financially, and they lack the financial intelligence to escape from their office prison. They look forward to surviving 15 more years when at age 65 they can retire and then begin to live. On a leaner budget, of course. How the Rich Handle Money Problems When looking at financial intelligence, it becomes easy to see that there are five core intelligences an individual must develop to become rich. This audiobook is about those five financial intelligences. This audiobook is also about integrity. When most people think of the word integrity, they think of it as an ethical concept. That is not what I mean when I use the word. Integrity is wholeness. According to Webster's, it is the quality or state of being complete or undivided. A person who has mastered the five financial intelligences in this audiobook has achieved financial integrity. When the rich have money problems, they use their financial integrity developed through many years of facing and solving problems to solve those problems. If the rich don't know the answer to their money problems, they don't walk away and throw in the towel. They seek out experts who can help them solve their problems. In the process, they become financially more intelligent and are that much more equipped to solve the next problem when it comes around. The rich don't quit, they learn, and by learning, they grow richer. In the following chapters, I will go into the five financial intelligences people need to develop if they want to increase their financial IQ. Personally, my days are dedicated to increasing the five financial intelligences. For me, my financial education never stops. At the start, my process to increase my financial IQ was difficult and clumsy, just like my golf game. There was a lot of failure. A lot of money lost, a lot of frustration, and a lot of personal doubt. At first, my classmates made more money than me. Today, I make much more money than most of my classmates. While I do enjoy the money, I work primarily for the challenge. I love learning. I work because I love the game of money, and I want to be the best I can be at my game. I could have retired a long time ago, but what would I do if I retired? Play golf? Golf is not my game. Golf is what I do for fun. Business, investing, and making money is my game. I love my game. I am passionate about the game. So if I retired, I would lose my passion. And what is life without passion? Do I think everyone should play this game of money? My answer is, like it or not, everyone is already playing the game of money. Rich or poor, we are all involved in the game of money. The difference is some people play harder, know the rules, and use them to their advantage more than others. Some people are more dedicated, more passionate, more committed to learning, and to winning. When it comes to the game of money, most people are playing, if they know they are playing at all, not to lose, rather than playing to win. Since we are all involved in the game of money anyway, better questions may be, Are you a student of the game of money? Are you dedicated to winning the game? Are you passionate about learning? Are you willing to be the best you can be? Do you want to be as rich as you can be? If you are, then continue on. This audiobook is for you. In summary, in 1971 and 1974, the rules of money changed. These changes have caused massive financial problems worldwide, requiring greater financial intelligence to solve them. Many people hope the government will solve their financial problems. I do not know how the government can solve your problems when it cannot solve its own money problems. 
In my lifetime, America went from the richest country in the world to the biggest debtor nation in the world. In my opinion, it is up to individuals to solve their own problems. The good news is that if you solve your own problems, you get smarter and richer. The lesson to be remembered from this chapter is that rich or poor, we all have money problems. The only way to get rich and increase your financial intelligence is to actively solve your money problems. Chapter 2 The Five Financial IQs There are five basic financial IQs. They are making more money, protecting your money, budgeting your money, leveraging your money, improving your financial information. Financial Intelligence versus Financial IQ Most of us know that a person with a mental IQ of 130 is supposedly smarter than a person with an IQ of 95. The same parallels can be drawn with financial IQ. You can be the equivalent of a genius when it comes to academic intelligence, but the equivalent of a moron when it comes to financial intelligence. Often I am asked, what is the difference between financial intelligence and financial IQ? My reply is, financial intelligence is that part of our mental intelligence we use to solve our financial problems. Financial IQ is the measurement of that intelligence. It is how we quantify our financial intelligence. For example, if I earn $100,000 and pay 20% in taxes, I have a higher financial IQ than someone who earns $100,000 and pays 50% in taxes. Financial IQ number one, making more money. Most of us have enough financial intelligence to make money. The more money you make, the higher your financial IQ number one. In other words, a person who earns $1 million a year has a measurably higher financial IQ number one than a person who earns $30,000 a year. And if two people each make $1 million a year and one pays less in taxes than the other, that person has a higher financial IQ. Financial IQ number two, protecting your money. A simple truth is that the world is out to take your money. But not all who take your money are crooks. One of the biggest financial predators of our money is taxes. If a person has a low financial IQ, he or she will pay more in taxes. An example of financial IQ is someone who pays 20% in taxes versus someone who pays 35% in taxes. The person who pays less in taxes has a measurably higher financial IQ. Financial IQ number three, budgeting your money. Budgeting your money requires a lot of financial intelligence. Many people earn a lot of money but fail to keep much money simply because they budget poorly. For example, a person who earns and spends $70,000 a year has a lower financial IQ than a person who earns $30,000 and is able to live well on $25,000 and invest $5,000. Being able to live well and still invest, no matter how much you make, requires a high level of financial intelligence. Having a surplus is something you have to actively budget for. Financial IQ number four, leveraging your money. After a person budgets a surplus, the next financial challenge is to leverage their surplus of money. While savings and a diversified mutual fund portfolio are a form of leverage, there are better ways to leverage your money. If a person is truthful, he or she has to admit it doesn't require much financial intelligence to save money and invest in mutual funds. You can train a monkey to save money and invest in mutual funds. That is why the returns on those investment vehicles are historically low. Financial IQ number four is measured in return on investment. For example, a person who earns 50% on his or her money has a higher financial IQ than someone who earns 5%. One more point. Many people think that higher returns on investment require higher degrees of risk. That is not true. Later in this audiobook, I will explain how I achieve exceptional returns and pay very little, if anything, in taxes, all with very low risk. Financial IQ number five improving your financial information. There is a bit of wisdom that goes, you need to learn to walk before you can run. 
This is true with financial intelligence. Before people can learn how to earn exceptionally high returns on their money, they need to learn the basics and the fundamentals of financial intelligence. One of the reasons so many people struggle with leveraging their money is because they are taught to turn their money over to financial experts, such as their mutual fund manager. The problem with turning your money over to financial experts is that you fail to learn, fail to increase your financial intelligence, and fail to become your own financial expert. It's easy to increase your financial intelligence if you have a strong foundation of financial information. But if your financial IQ is weak, then new financial information can be confusing and have seemingly little value. One of the benefits of being dedicated to your financial education is that over time you will be better able to grasp more sophisticated financial information. Just as mathematicians are able to do complex equations after years of practicing math problems. Personally, I do pretty well when it comes to financial information. After years of study, I can sit in a room and understand most financial concepts. Yet, when it comes to technology, I'm a dinosaur. I can barely use a cell phone or turn on a computer. My job in this audiobook is to make financial information as simple as possible. My promise to you is that I write only about things I have done or am currently doing. As you know, there are many teachers and authors who tell you what you should be doing, but don't do what they are advising. Many financial experts do not really know if what they talk or write about actually works. This does not mean I recommend you do exactly what I do, nor does it mean what I do will work for you. I simply want to share with you my experiences, a journey of solving financial problems that continues today. I share with you what I have learned, with the intent that it will assist you in increasing your own financial IQ number five, improving your financial information. We have other IQs. We are all different. We have different interests and dislikes. We have different strengths and weaknesses. We have different gifts and geniuses. I say this because I do not think financial intelligence is the most important intelligence or the only intelligence. Financial intelligence is simply an intelligence we all need, since we live in a world of money, or to be more exact, currency. As my rich dad said, Rich or poor, smart or not smart, we all use money. There are many important types of intelligence, such as medical intelligence. Every time I see my doctor, I am grateful that he dedicated his life to developing his intelligence and his gift. I am also glad I have enough money and insurance to pay for whatever medical challenges I may face. To this, Rich Dad said, Money is not the most important thing in life, but money does affect everything that is important. When you think about it, money affects our standard of living, health, and education. Studies show that poor people have poorer health, poorer education, and a shorter lifespan. In summary, after 1971, the dollar turned into a currency. In 1974, businesses stopped paying employees a paycheck for life. As a result of these two major changes, financial intelligence became more important than ever. In summary, the five financial IQs are Financial IQ number one, making more money. Financial IQ number two, protecting your money. Financial IQ number three, budgeting your money. Financial IQ number four, leveraging your money. Financial IQ number five, improving your financial information. Financial intelligence is the intelligence we use to solve our specific financial problems, and financial IQ measures or quantifies our results. And now, on to financial IQ number one, making more money. Chapter three. Financial IQ number one, making more money. After four years at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, I graduated in 1969 and got my first job with Standard Oil sailing on their oil tankers. It was a great job with a great company. I only worked for seven months and then had five months off, got to see the world, and the pay was pretty good at approximately $47,000 a year. That's the equivalent of $140,000 today. 
After only four months, I resigned from my high-paying job with Standard Oil and joined the Marine Corps to fight in the Vietnam War. I felt an obligation to serve my country. At the time, many of my friends were doing everything they could to avoid the draft. Many were going on to graduate school. One ran and hid in Canada. For me, going to war and fighting was not the hardest part of my decision. From my naive vantage point, the war actually seemed kind of exciting. I was not concerned about fighting, killing, and possibly being killed. The toughest part of my decision was the pay cut I would have to take. Marine Corps second lieutenants were being paid $2,400 a year. At Standard Oil, I was making that in two weeks. Five years later, with one year spent in Vietnam flying helicopters, I was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps. My first and immediate challenge was financial IQ number one, making more money. I was 27 years old and had two great professions to fall back on, one as a ship's officer, the second as a pilot. For a while, I considered returning to Standard Oil and asking for my job back. I liked Standard Oil and I liked San Francisco. I also liked the pay. I would have started at about $60,000 a year since Standard Oil counted my time in the Marine Corps towards seniority. My second option was to get a job as a pilot with the airlines. Most of my fellow Marine pilots were being offered great jobs with a pretty good starting pay of about $32,000 a year. Although the pay was not as good as Standard Oil, being an airline pilot appealed to me. On top of that, whatever the airlines would pay me had to be better than the $985 a month the Marine Corps was paying me to be a pilot after five years of service. Instead of returning to Standard Oil or flying for the airlines, however, I took a job with the Xerox Corporation in downtown Honolulu. My starting pay was $720 a month. Once again, I took a pay cut. My friends and family thought the war had made me crazy. Now you may ask why I would take a job paying only $720 a month in a very expensive city like Honolulu. The answer is found in the theme of this book, Increasing Financial IQ. I took the job with Xerox not for the pay, but to increase my financial intelligence. I decided that the best way for me to earn money was as an entrepreneur. I knew that if I were to become an entrepreneur, I needed sales skills. There was only one problem. I was terribly shy and dreaded rejection. The four years I spent working for Xerox, from 1974 to 1978, were very hard. For the first two years, I was almost fired a number of times because I couldn't sell, but I had a goal to become the top salesman in the Honolulu branch, and I faced my challenges with determination. After the first two years, the sales training and the on-the-street experience began to pay off and I finally reached my goal of becoming number one in sales at the Honolulu branch. I had solved the problem of being shy and hating rejection and had learned to sell. Even better, I was making a lot more money than I would have as a ship's officer or an airline pilot. If I had just settled into a job after the war, I would never have overcome my fear of rejection and my shyness, and I would never have reaped the rewards of facing those challenges and conquering them. I learned a valuable lesson from my experience at Xerox. Solving the problem was the path to wealth. Once I reached my goal and became number one in sales, I resigned to take on my next challenge, building a business. In my previous book, Before You Quit Your Job, I wrote about the process of building my first major business, a business that brought to market the first nylon and Velcro surfer wallets. In that book, I wrote about the eight components that make up any business and about how not having all eight of those business components is the reason why so many businesses fail and remain unprofitable. I believe it's a very important book for anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur and start their own business. In the book, I wrote about how my business went to extreme success in about a year, making me a millionaire, and then failed suddenly. I described the feelings of depression and loss, and a strong desire to run away and hide after the business collapsed. I was deeply in debt and facing the biggest financial problem of my life up to that point. Rich Dad, however, encouraged me to face my problems and rebuild the business instead of running and declaring bankruptcy. 
He reminded me that solving this messy problem would increase my financial intelligence. It was some of the best advice I've ever received. Rebuilding the wreckage of my business was my business school. The first thing I had to do was put together the eight parts of my business. The second thing I had to do was redefine my business by finding a competitive niche. You see, by 1981, the year I was rebuilding the business, the market was inundated by other wallet makers. Prices for wallets dropped from $10 at retail, the price I had established, to $1 a wallet on the streets of Waikiki and the world. Nylon wallets had become a commodity, and as you know, the market for commodities goes to the lowest-priced producer. In order to compete as a commodity, I needed a market niche. I needed to become a brand. That opportunity came in the form of rock and roll. As described in Before You Quit Your Job, I stumbled into the rock and roll business and saved my business by licensing the rights to use rock band names on my wallets. Soon, I was producing wallets for Van Halen, Judas Priest, Duran Duran, Iron Maiden, and others. Because I was a legally licensed product, I got my retail price back up to $10 a wallet. Although I now had to pay a royalty to the bands, being a legally licensed rock and roll product opened doors to retailers across America and throughout the world. My business boomed, and money came pouring back in. As I've said, the way to increase one's financial intelligence is by solving the problem in front of you. By 1981, I had solved the problem of rebuilding my business. Then, the next problem appeared beating my low-priced competitors and the imitators who took my product and were making money while I was losing money. This problem came in the form of pirates. The very people who copied my first product, the original nylon wallet, were now copying my competitive niche. They started producing the same licensed products I was producing, selling at lower prices, only not paying a royalty to the bands. After a few months of fighting the pirates, I realized the only people getting rich were my attorneys. There is a saying that goes, if you can't beat them, join them. Tired of hemorrhaging money in a losing battle, I fired my attorneys and flew to Korea, Taiwan, and Indonesia to join forces with the pirates. Instead of fighting them in court, which was costing me much more money than I was making, I licensed my competitors to produce my wallets for me. My production costs dropped, my legal fees went down, and I had better factories behind me. I could now do what I did best, sell. Business boomed again. Soon our products were in department stores and at rock concerts. In 1982, a new television channel hit the airwaves, MTV. Our business went through the roof, and once again, money poured in. In January of 1984, I sold my share of the rock and roll nylon wallet business to my two partners. Kim and I left Hawaii and moved to California to start our business education company. I had no idea there would be such a difference between selling a product and selling education. 1985 was the worst year of our lives. Our savings ran out, and soon the problem of not enough money was a major one. I'd been broke before, but Kim hadn't. That she stayed with me is a testament to her character, not my good looks. Yet we worked together and built an international business teaching entrepreneurship and investing with offices in the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Canada. In 1994, Kim and I sold the business and retired with enough passive income from our real estate investments to support us for the rest of our lives. But we got bored. After our brief retirement, Kim and I produced our board game Cash Flow in 1996, and Rich Dad Poor Dad was released as a self-published book in 1997. In mid-2000, Oprah Winfrey had me on her program for an hour, and the rest is history. Today, the Rich Dad Company is an international business. Much of the success is due to lessons learned from the failures and successes of my previous businesses. If I hadn't learned from solving my problems, I would never have made it this far. If I had thrown in the towel and let circumstances overwhelm me, you wouldn't be listening to this audiobook right now. Every goal has a process. As we all know, every worthwhile goal has a process and takes work. 
For example, to become a medical doctor, there is a rigorous process of education and training. Many people dream of becoming a doctor, but the process gets in their way. One of the reasons people lack financial IQ number one, making more money, is because they want the money, but not the process. What many people do not realize is that it's the process that makes them rich, not the money. One of the reasons lottery winners or kids who inherit family wealth are soon broke is because they received the money but did not have to go through the process. Many other people fail to become rich because they value a steady paycheck more than the learning process of becoming financially smarter and richer. They are held back by the fear of being poor. It is this very fear that keeps them from taking the chances and solving the problems required to become rich. At this point, it's important to point out that financial intelligence is also emotional intelligence. Warren Buffett, the world's richest investor, says, If you cannot control your emotions, you cannot control your money. The same is true for your process. One of the toughest parts of my process was not quitting when I was depressed, not losing my temper when I was frustrated, and to continue to study when I wanted to run. Another reason many people fail in their process is they cannot live without instant gratification. The main reason I mentioned the low pay I received at the start of my life was to illustrate the importance of delayed gratification. Many will sacrifice a richer tomorrow for a few bucks today. I did not make much money in my twenties and thirties, but I make millions today. One of the reasons people do not increase financial IQ number one and increase their income is because they stick with what they know. Instead of taking on a new challenge and learning, they play it safe. Now this doesn't mean you should do stupid and risky things. There are many things we could do but choose not to. My point is that I chose my next challenge carefully, not haphazardly. I asked myself, what will my life be like if I take on this challenge and succeed? It's the same question I ask you to ask yourself. Helen Keller, the subject of the great movie The Miracle Worker, once said, Life is a daring adventure, or nothing. I agree. In my opinion, one way to increase your financial intelligence, number one, is to look at life as a learning adventure. For too many people, life is about playing it safe, doing the right things, and choosing job security over life. Your life does not have to be risky or dangerous. Life is about learning, and learning is about adventure. That is why I didn't go back to sailing ships or flying planes, even though I loved both professions. It was time for a new adventure. Intelligence is not about memorizing old answers and avoiding mistakes, behavior our school system defines as intelligent. True intelligence is about learning to solve problems in order to qualify to solve bigger problems. True intelligence is about the joy of learning rather than the fear of failing. One of the reasons I make more money than my classmates who sailed ships or flew planes is because they worked for paychecks. I, on the other hand, wanted to build assets as an entrepreneur and acquire assets as an investor. In other words, if you look at the four types of people in the cash flow quadrant, Employees and self-employed workers focus on the income column of their financial statement, and big business owners and investors focus on the asset column. One of the hardest things to get across to an employee or the self-employed worker is that a big business owner or investor doesn't work for money. A big business owner or investor technically works for free. Employees and the self-employed work to be paid, and they must be paid before they work. Working for free possibly for years, is not in their emotional or professional makeup. As a general rule, they do not work to build or acquire assets. In accounting terms, an employee or self-employed works for earned income, and a big business or investor works for passive or portfolio income. In the next chapter on Financial IQ number 2, Protecting Your Money, you will find out why the kind of income a person works for makes a big financial difference. Earned income is the hardest income to protect from financial predators. That is why working for earned income is not the financially smartest thing to do. Many self-employed people do not own a business. They own a job. If self-employed people stop working, their income also stops or declines. By definition, a job is not an asset. 
Assets put money in your pocket, whether you work or not. Why the rich get richer One of the reasons the poor and middle class struggle is that they work for money and a steady paycheck. The problem with that is you have to work harder, longer, or charge more to make more money. The problem with physically working harder and longer is that we all have a finite amount of time and energy. One of the reasons why the rich get richer is that every year they work to build or acquire more assets. Adding more assets does not require working harder or longer. In fact, the higher a person's financial IQ, the less he or she works while acquiring more and better quality assets. You see, assets work for the rich by producing passive income. Every year, Kim and I set goals as to how many new assets we want. We do not set goals to make more money. When Kim first started investing in real estate in 1989, she had a goal of 20 residential properties in 10 years. At the time, it seemed like a major task. She started with a two-bedroom, one-bath house in Portland, Oregon. 18 months, not 10 years later, she blew past her goal of 20 properties. After she reached her goal, she sold the units, taking capital gains of over a million dollars and upgraded for bigger and better units in Phoenix, Arizona, tax-free. In 2007, her personal goal is to add an additional 500 rental units to her portfolio. She already has over 1,000 units paying her passive income, the least taxed income every month. She makes more money than most men, and she has accomplished all of this as an entrepreneur in the investor quadrant. My focus is to increase my cash flow from business assets and commodities. I invest heavily in oil, gold, and silver companies. As an educational entrepreneur, each time I write a book, I receive income for years in the form of royalties from approximately 50 publishers in different parts of the world. I do not write about this to brag. In fact, I hesitate to disclose our wealth and how we made it. There are people who resent those who make a lot of money. As you will find out in the next chapter on Financial Predators, it's dangerous to let people know you are rich. One big reason why I risk disclosing what we do and make is because Kim and I are committed to your financial education and increasing your financial IQ. A massive problem with financial education is that most of the people selling or sharing financial education come from the employee and self-employed quadrants. Most are not really rich. Many are journalists who write about money but have little money themselves. Many of these financial experts have retirement plans filled with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Many are counting on the stock market for financial survival and will be wiped out if there is a massive market crash during their retirement. Many will struggle if the U.S. dollar continues to decline in purchasing power and inflation takes off. In short, many financial experts handing out financial advice do not know if their retirement plans will work. If they did, many would have retired. Kim and I know our retirement plan works. We know because passive income pours in every month from our assets. We are not putting money in savings, bonds, or mutual funds for the future. If we are wiped out, which is always possible, our real asset will be our financial IQ. We can rebuild again because we focused more on learning rather than earning. We learn to manage our own money rather than turn our money over to a so-called financial expert. People will pay money for you to solve their problems. For example, I will pay money to my doctor to keep me healthy. I pay money to my housekeeper to keep my house tidy. I pay the person who runs a local restaurant for providing great food and a great dining experience. I put money in the offering plate at church to support my spiritual guidance and education. Kim makes a lot of money because she solves a big problem, the problem of quality housing at an affordable price. The more she works to solve that problem, the more money she makes. I work hard to solve the problem of the need for financial education. Simply put, there are trillions of ways to make more money because there are trillions, if not infinite, problems to solve. The question is, which problems do you want to solve? The more problems you solve, the richer you will become. A true capitalist is simply someone who recognizes a problem and creates a product or service to address that problem. You can charge a higher price if your product or service has a higher perceived value, 
but there needs to be added value. For example, I charge more money for my books and games because to some people there is more perceived educational value in them. For many other people, my books and games are not worth the price. Begin now to think about what problems you need to solve. Engage those problems head on and the money will follow. And once you have that money, you're going to need to use every ounce of your financial intelligence to protect it. That's what the next chapter is all about. Financial IQ number two, protecting your money. Chapter 4 Financial IQ Number 2 Protecting Your Money Protecting your money from financial predators is important. As most of us know, the world is filled with people waiting for the opportunity to help themselves to your money. Many of these people are very smart and powerful. If they are smarter than you or have more power than you, they will get your money. This is why Financial IQ Number 2 is so important. How do you measure financial IQ number two? Financial IQ number two is measured in percentages. Here's what I mean. The following are three examples of three different percentages. Number one. In America, a person who earns $100,000 a year from wages may pay as much as 50% in combined taxes, such as federal, state, and FICA. This person's net after-tax income is $50,000. Number two, another person earns $100,000 income from their investments and pays 15% in taxes. This person's net after-tax income is $85,000. Number three, a third person earns $100,000 income and pays 0% in taxes. This person's net after-tax income is $100,000. In the examples above, the person who pays the least percentage in taxes has the highest financial IQ number two, protecting your money, because less money is lost to financial predators. In later chapters, I will go into how to earn a lot of money and pay nothing in taxes legally. But for now, keep this simple idea in mind. Financial IQ number two measures the percentage of income a person keeps against the percentage of income financial predators take. Bunnies, Birds, and Bugs Rich Dad's lessons to his son and me on the importance of protecting money from financial predators started at a very early age, before we had any money. Because we were young, Rich Dad used a very simple example of farmers to make his point. He said a farmer needs to protect his crops from bunnies, birds, and bugs. Bunnies, birds, and bugs are thieves to a farmer. Continuing on with his bee theme, Rich Dad's list of real-world financial predators included bureaucrats, bankers, brokers, businesses, barristers, brides, beaux, and brothers-in-law. The first B, bureaucrats. As we all know, taxes are our single largest expense. The job of the tax department is to get your money and to turn it over to a government bureaucrat who spends it. This is one reason why financial IQ number two is so important. You cannot become rich if all the money you make is taken from you by financial predators. Taxes are important. Before going on, I need to say that I am not against the government or paying taxes. Rich Dad said, taxes are an expense for living in a civilized society. He pointed out to his son and me that taxes pay for schools and teachers, fire and police protection, court systems, the military, roads, airports, and the general operation of the business of government. Rich Dad's frustration with taxes was that bureaucrats very rarely solved the problems they faced, which meant taxes had to keep going up. Realizing that we will only pay more in taxes, Rich Dad's philosophy was, a bureaucrat's job is to get their hands deeper in your pockets legally, and your job is to have them take as little as possible legally. Which political party is better? 
Just so you know, I am not Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal, socialist or capitalist. When asked, I simply reply that I am all of the above. For example, as a capitalist, I want to make a lot of money and pay as little in taxes as possible. As a socialist, I make tax-deductible donations to charities and worthy causes, and I want my taxes to provide for a better society and care for those who truly cannot care for themselves. Many people believe that Republicans are better than Democrats when it comes to money. The facts do not support their belief. Republicans say, Democrats tax and spend. Republicans, on the other hand, borrow and spend. The net result, regardless of party, is increasing long-term national debt, a debt that will be passed on to future generations in the form of higher taxes. In 1980, Republican President Reagan gave us supply-side economics, that is, voodoo economics. The new economic theories promoted by the great communicator Reagan, an actor, not an economist, were the illusion that we could cut taxes and continue to pay the government's bills by borrowing money. This is the same as taking a cut in pay and using credit cards to pay bills. When Thomas Gale Moore, then a member of President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisers, noticed that the United States was crossing the creditor-debtor threshold in the mid-1980s, he said not to worry, we can pay off anybody by running a press. Because of the 1971 change in our money and Reagan's supply-side economics, the national debt of the U.S. exploded. By the end of Reagan's reign, the federal debt was $2.6 trillion. President Reagan's vice president, the first George Bush, realizing the national debt was exploding due to the loss of revenue from Reagan's tax cuts, ran for president promising, Read my lips, no new taxes. After he was elected, he raised taxes and was not re-elected. Then President Clinton, a Democrat, entered office. After having a little trouble with his zipper, he left office claiming to have balanced the budget and not increased the national debt. Of course, just as he lied about his sex life, he lied about balancing the budget. He balanced the budget by counting tax dollars for Social Security and Medicare as income. Instead of the money going into the Social Security Trust Fund, he spent it. Clinton, however, did speak one truth during his term of office. He admitted that there was no such thing as a Social Security Trust Fund. During his presidency, Medicare began to operate in the red, meaning more money was going out than coming in. Soon, Social Security will be in the same predicament as 78 million baby boomers begin to retire in 2008. Enter the second President Bush. Uniting the world after 9-11, he then used his popularity to wage war against Iraq on unsubstantiated claims. Today, he is one of the most unpopular presidents in history. Not only was the war a disaster, but in order to prevent a disaster in the economy, the Federal Reserve Bank cut interest rates and flooded the world with funny money under his watch. After just five years in office, President Bush has borrowed more money than all U.S. presidents in history combined. The current subprime crisis is the fruit of his economic policies. All of this is to say it doesn't matter which party is elected into office. If it's Democrats, they will probably tax and spend. If it's Republicans, they will probably borrow and spend. The net result is the same. Greater debt, bigger financial problems, and higher taxes. All funded by taking as much of your money as possible. The second B. Bankers. Banks were created to protect your money from bandits. But what if you found out your banker was a bandit? What if you found out that the very people you entrusted with your money were siphoning off more money than you knew about and doing it legally? While he was New York Attorney General, New York Governor Elliot Spitzer investigated a number of investment banking firms and large mutual fund companies, finding them guilty of several illegal practices. The very people the public entrusted with its money were skimming a little more money than they should have been. The guilty companies were fined a trifling amount compared to the dollar amounts they took. While the paltry size of the fines is disturbing, what is even more disturbing is that these bankers are still in business today. The problem is that Elliot Spitzer's investigation was limited to investment banking firms in New York City. 
The problem of bankers taking money from innocent customers is a worldwide one. As more businesses stop caring for workers for life, more workers are forced to save for their own retirement. Workers do not have the money to hire professional financial services like businesses do. This is causing the pool of financially naive money to grow like a hot air balloon, making bankers and people who sell financial services to workers grow richer and richer. Today, workers' retirement funds are fueling a global economic boom. Retirement funds are an ocean of money, unprecedented in world history, guarded by bankers, not you. The third B. Brokers. Broker is another word for salesperson. In the world of money, there are brokers for stocks, bonds, real estate, mortgages, insurance, businesses, etc. One of the problems today is that most people are getting their financial advice from salespeople, not rich people. If you meet a rich broker, you need to ask if the broker got rich from his or her sales ability or financial ability. As you know, there are good brokers and bad brokers. Simply put, good brokers make you richer and bad brokers make excuses. The following is an abbreviated list of things that helped us find and keep good brokers. We look for brokers who were also students of their profession. We want to know if they invest in what they sell. After all, why should you invest in what they're selling if the broker doesn't have the confidence to invest in the same stocks? We wanted a relationship, not a transaction. Many brokers only want to sell. The fourth B, businesses. All businesses have something to sell. If they do not sell, they are out of business. I often ask, is this business's product or service making me richer or poorer? One of the reasons so many struggle financially is they buy products that make them poorer and then make themselves even poorer by paying for that product for years with high interest credit cards. If you want to be rich, become a customer of businesses that are dedicated to making you richer. For example, I am a long-term customer of a number of investment newsletters and financial magazines. I am also a customer of businesses that sell educational products and seminars. In other words, I am a good customer to some of my competitors. I like spending money on products or services that make me richer. The fifth B, Brides and Bows. We all know that some people marry for money. Both men and women marry for money rather than love. Like it or not, money plays an important role in any marriage. Rich Dad called people who marry for money love predators. The more money you have, the more they love you. In his much-publicized divorce, Paul McCartney may have to give up 50% of his estimated $1 billion estate. That is a lot of money. This shows that McCartney has earned a lot of money as a musical genius, but his lack of financial IQ number two is costing him a lot of money that a little premarital planning might have saved him. The sixth B. Brothers-in-law. Death is the final exit. It is another time when predators appear, or I should say, vultures. If you are rich, not having a financial IQ can be expensive for your loved ones. Your brother-in-law's grandchildren, children you've never met, suddenly become family and come to cry at your funeral. If you have a high financial IQ, the percentage of your money these grieving relatives receive will be controlled by you even after you have moved on. Those with a high financial IQ have wills, trusts, and other legal means of protecting their wealth and final wishes from death predators. The seventh B. Barristers. You may remember the person who sued McDonald's claiming the coffee was too hot. That is an example of a financial predator using the court system to get your money. Millions of people are waiting for any excuse to use a lawsuit to get rich. This is why the seventh B is for barristers or lawyers. There are lawyers whose sole purpose in life is to take you to court and take your money. Knowing these predators are lurking, there are three things a financially intelligent person must do. Keep nothing of value in your name. It was my poor dad who proudly said, My house is in my name. Financially smart people would not have their houses in their names. 
buy personal liability insurance immediately. Remember, you cannot buy insurance when you need it. You must buy it before you need it. Hold assets of value in legal entities. In the U.S., the good legal entities are C corporations, S corporations, limited liability corporations, LLCs, and limited liability partnerships, LLPs. There are also bad legal entities. These are sole proprietorships and general partnerships. The rules have changed. As you know, in 1974, workers needed to become investors saving for their retirement. This gave rise to the 401k. The problem with a 401k is that the government plugged this loophole for workers, too. Let me explain. When a person works for money, his or her income is taxed as earned income, the most highly taxed income. When a worker withdraws money from his or her 401k plan, that income comes out as, you guessed it, earned income. Guess what interest from savings is taxed at? Once again, earned income. This means a person who works hard, saves money, gets out of debt, and saves for retirement in a 401k plan is working for the most highly taxed income, earned income. This is not financially intelligent. People following these rules demonstrate a low financial intelligence because they give away a large percentage of their income. A financially intelligent person does not want a big paycheck. A financially educated person would rather be paid royalties or dividends because taxes are lower on these types of income. A knowledgeable investor at least knows enough to invest for portfolio or passive income. Personally, I am not trying to change the system. My personal philosophy is that it is easier to change myself than to change the system. In other words, I am not a person who battles the winds that drive windmills. Hence, I am not politically inclined. I don't believe politics or politicians are effective against those who run the world of money. It seems that most politicians, in order to be elected, need to be pawns of the very people who control the world's money. Most financial advisors are employees of these world bankers. I simply want to know the rules and play by the rules. This does not mean I believe the rules are fair or equitable. They aren't. The rules of money are what they are, and they change regularly. Besides, this new world of money, even though unfair, has done a lot of good. It has brought tremendous wealth and new products to the world, raising the standards of living everywhere. Quality of life for billions of people is improving. Money has done a lot of good. Unfortunately, these changes have come at great expense to many countries, our environment, and many people. Many have become very rich taking advantage of the financially naive. Many have become rich by taking the wealth of others. This is why financial IQ number two, protecting your money, is a very important financial intelligence. Ignorance is bliss, and that's what the financial predators are banking on, your ignorance making them blissfully rich. Chapter 5 Financial IQ number 3 Budgeting Your Money My poor dad often advised, live below your means. My rich dad said, if you're going to be rich, you need to expand your means. In this chapter, you will find out why living below your means is not a financially intelligent way to become rich. You will learn about budgeting and that there are two kinds of budgets. One is a budget deficit and the other is a budget surplus. The reason financial IQ number three is so important is because learning how to budget for a surplus is the key to becoming rich and staying rich. A budget is a plan. One of the definitions of the word budget is a plan for the coordination of resources and expenditures. Rich Dad said a budget is a plan. He went on to say most people use their budget as a plan to become poor or middle class rather than a plan to become rich. Most people operate their lives on a budget deficit rather than a budget surplus. If you want to be rich, choose a budget surplus and create one by increasing income, not reducing expenses. A Budget Deficit I have a friend in Atlanta who makes a lot of money. He has to make a lot of money. 
If he stops making a lot of money, his money problems will eat him alive. He has chosen to create a budget deficit. Every time Dan makes more money, he either buys a bigger house, a newer car, or takes an expensive vacation with the kids. He has another bad habit. Every ten years or so, he marries a younger woman and has a new child. Dan grows older, but his wives are always about the same age, twenty-five. Dan is an expert at taking a lot of money and making his money problems worse through deficits. A budget surplus. The second financial choice is to plan for a budget surplus. After making money, financial IQ number one, and protecting your money, financial IQ number two, learning how to budget for a surplus is essential for achieving financial integrity. The following are a number of lessons I have learned from my rich dad and other wealthy people about budgeting for a budget surplus. Budget tip number one: a budget surplus is an expense. This is one of the best financial lessons my rich dad passed on to his son and me. Pointing to the financial statement, he said, "You have to make a surplus an expense." In Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I wrote about the importance of paying yourself first. Most people know they should save, tithe, and invest. The problem is, after paying their expenses, most people don't have any money left to do so. In other words, most of the middle class's financial priorities are: priority number one, get a high-paying job; priority number two, make the mortgage and car payments; priority number three, pay bills on time; priority number four, save, tithe, and invest. In other words, paying themselves first is their last priority. In order to create a budget surplus, a surplus must be a priority. The best way to make a surplus a priority is to reprioritize your spending habits. Make saving, tithing, and investing at least priority number two, and list them as an expense on your financial statement. I know most of you can agree with the logic of what I am saying, and agree that people need to make saving, tithing, and investing a higher priority. I also know this is easier said than done. So let me tell you how Kim and I handled this problem. Soon after we were married, we had the same financial problems many newlyweds have. We had more expenses than income. To solve this problem, we hired Betty the bookkeeper. Betty was instructed to take thirty percent of all income off the top as an expense, and put that money in the asset column. Using simple numbers as an example, if we had one thousand dollars in income and fifteen hundred dollars in expenses, Betty was to take thirty percent of the one thousand dollars and put that money in the asset column. With the remaining seven hundred dollars, she was to pay the fifteen hundred dollars in expenses. Betty nearly died. She thought we were nuts. She said, "You can't do that. You have bills to pay." She almost quit. You see, Betty was a great bookkeeper, but she budgeted like a poor person. She paid everyone else first and herself last. Since there was rarely anything left over, she paid herself nothing. Her creditors, the government, and bankers were all more important than Betty. Betty argued and fought. All of her training told her to pay everyone else first. The thought of not paying her bills or taxes made her weak in the knees. I finally got her to understand she was doing us a favor. She was helping us out. I explained to her that she was helping us solve a very big problem—the problem of not having enough money. And as you know, solving problems make us smarter. When she understood she was actually creating income through expense, she was willing to go along with our plan to create a budget surplus. For every dollar of income, Betty would take thirty cents and put it in savings, tithing, and investing. With the seventy cents from every dollar left, she was to pay taxes, liabilities such as our mortgage and car payments, and then our bills such as electricity, water, food, etc. Needless to say, for a long time we came up short every month. There were some months Kim and I came up as much as four thousand dollars short. We could have paid the four thousand dollars from our assets, but that was our money. The asset column belonged to us. Instead of panicking, Betty was instructed to sit down with us and let us know how short we were each month. After taking a deep breath, Kim and I would then say, "It's time to get back to financial IQ number one, making more money." 
With that, Kim and I would hustle around doing whatever we could to make more money. Kim, with her marketing background, often called businesses and offered to consult with them on their marketing plans. She also took modeling jobs and sold a line of clothes. I offered to teach investment or sales and marketing classes. For a few months, I trained sales teams at a local real estate company. I even made money by helping a family move and by clearing some land for another family. In other words, we swallowed our pride and did whatever it took to make the extra money. Somehow we always made it, and somehow Betty stuck with us and assisted us with our problem, solution, and process, even though she worried more about us than we did. Unfortunately, Betty could help us, but was unwilling to help herself. Last we heard, she retired and moved in with her single daughter. They share expenses, using Betty's payments from Social Security to pay them. They do not have a budget surplus. In 1989, Kim purchased her first rental property. She put down $5,000 and made $25 in positive cash flow per month. Today, Kim controls a multi-million dollar portfolio and over a thousand rental units. If we had not made investing an expense and paid ourselves first, we might still be paying everyone else first. God is our partner. As far as tithing goes, we continue to donate a large percentage to charitable organizations. It's important to give. As my very religious friend says, God does not need to receive, but humans need to give. Also, the reason we give is because tithing is our way of paying our partner, God. God is the best business partner I've ever had. He asks for 10% and lets me keep the other 90%. You know what happens if you stop paying your partners? They stop working with you. That is why we tithe. Budget tip number two. The expense column is the crystal ball. If you ever want to predict a person's future, just look at the person's discretionary monthly expenses. Rich Dad said, You can tell a person's future by looking at what they spend their time and money on. He also said, Time and money are very important assets. Spend them wisely. Budget tip number three. My assets pay for my liabilities. My poor dad believed in buying cheap. He thought being frugal was smart budgeting. We lived in an average house in an average neighborhood. My rich dad loved luxury. He lived in an affluent neighborhood and lived an abundant lifestyle. He did not like being cheap, although he was still careful with his money. If my poor dad wanted a luxury item, he simply denied himself the luxury of owning. He said, we can't afford it. If my rich dad wanted a luxury item, he simply said, how can I afford it? And the way he afforded it was to create an asset in the asset column, an asset that paid for the liability. In other words, he acquired assets by paying himself first. With the cash flow from the assets, he then purchased his luxury liabilities. If he wanted big luxuries, he first created big assets. What many people do is buy big luxuries first and never have enough money to purchase assets. Again, it's a matter of priorities. The Bentley Account Two years ago, I wanted a new car, a Bentley convertible. The price? $200,000. I had the money in my asset column. I could have purchased the car for cash. The problem with buying a $200,000 Bentley with cash is that the car is worth only $125,000 the moment I drive it off the lot. That is not a smart use of my cash. Instead of spending my cash, I called my stockbroker Tom and authorized him to convert some of my gold and silver shares into $200,000 cash. His job was to take the $200,000 and turn it into $450,000. The project was named the Bentley Account. It took Tom about eight months, but he finally called and said, You can buy your Bentley. I then wrote a check and paid for the Bentley with the cash that had been created by my assets. The reason I needed the account traded up to $450,000 is because the extra $50,000 was to offset the taxes on the capital gains and the commission that Tom made. At the end of the day, I had my Bentley, and I still had the original $200,000. If I had just paid cash for the Bentley without trading the account, 
I would have lost my $200,000 in cash assets, and I would have lost an additional $75,000 due to the instant depreciation when I drove the car off the lot. In the chapter on Financial IQ number 2, Protecting Your Money, I wrote about how good brokers can make you rich and bad brokers make excuses. The Bentley account is an example of a good broker making me rich and happy, allowing me to afford the luxuries of life. So keep looking for a good broker if you don't already have one. At this point, it might be beneficial to remind you what an asset and a liability are. In my book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I define them simply as this. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket. A liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. There's nothing wrong with enjoying liabilities as long as you continue to pay yourself first and purchase them through the income generated by your assets. In the previous example, I used my assets to purchase my liability, and at the end of the day, I still had my asset and my Bentley. Budget tip number four, spend to get rich. When the going gets tough, most people cut back rather than spend. This is one reason why so many people fail to acquire and maintain wealth. For example, in the world of business, when a company's sales begin to drop, one of the first things the accountants do is cut back on spending. And one of the first things they cut back on is spending on advertising and promotion. With less advertising and promotion, sales drop and the problem gets worse. One sign of high financial intelligence is knowing when to spend and when to cut back. When Kim and I realized we were in trouble, instead of allowing our bookkeeper Betty to cut back and pay bills first, we went into full-scale sales, marketing, and promotion. We spent time, money, and energy increasing our income. The lesson my rich dad taught me about financial intelligence is really about being resourceful. He taught his son and me to be resourceful and turn problems into opportunities. He said, when I was a kid, I was poor. I am rich today because I saw being poor as an opportunity, a very important resource God gave me to use to become rich. Financial IQ number three, budgeting your money, like financial IQ number two, protecting your money, is measured in percentages, the percentage of income that reaches your asset column. And the stock market plunged nearly 400 points. The Federal Reserve and central banks around the world began injecting billions in cash into the economy to make sure the panic did not spread. The market was still nervous the next day. As I was getting ready for the day, a newscaster on a morning television program was interviewing three financial planners and getting their opinions. Their unanimous advice was, don't panic, stay the course. When asked for further advice, all three said, save money, get out of debt, and invest for the long term in a well-diversified portfolio of mutual funds. As I finished shaving, I wondered if these financial experts had all gone to the same school for parrots. Finally, one advisor took a moment to say something different. She began by condemning the real estate market for causing the mess in the stock market, blaming greedy investors, unscrupulous real estate agents, and predatory mortgage lenders for causing the subprime mortgage mess, which led to the crash in the stock market. This advisor said, I told my clients that real estate was risky, and my advice has not changed. Real estate is a risky investment, and investors should invest for the long term in blue-chip stocks and mutual funds. As the financial planner on television was ending her attack on real estate, my wife Kim walked into the room and said, Remember, we have a closing today on the 300-unit apartment house. Nodding my head, I said, I'll be there. As I finished dressing, I thought, It's funny the financial advisor saying that investing in real estate is risky. The real estate markets are crashing at the same time Kim and I are buying a $17 million apartment house in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we are excited about it. Are we on the same planet? So what is the difference between the financial planner who was negative on real estate and why was I excited about buying more property? The answers to that question are found in this chapter through two financial concepts, control and leverage. The new capitalism puts millions of workers' money into investments that allow them very little control or leverage. Because I have control over my investments, I am not as affected by market crashes. Because I have control, I am confident about using a lot more leverage. 
So what is leverage? In very simple terms, the definition of leverage is doing more with less. A person who puts money in the bank, for example, has no leverage. It's the person's money. A dollar in savings has a leverage factor of one to one. The saver puts up all the money. For my investment in the 300-unit apartment house, my banker put up 80% of the $17 million real estate investment. By using my banker's money, my leverage is one to four. For every dollar I invest in the deal, the bank lends me four dollars. So why did the financial planner on TV say that real estate was such a risky investment? Once again, the answer is control. If an investor lacks the financial intelligence to control the investment, the use of leverage is very risky. Since most financial planners put people into investments where they have no control, they should not use leverage. Using leverage to invest in something you do not control would be like buying a car without a steering wheel and then stomping on the gas pedal. Most of the people being hurt by the real estate meltdown are people who were counting on the real estate market to keep going up and increasing their home's value. Many people borrowed money against their inflated home value. Now their home may be worth less than what they owe. They have no control over the investment and are at the mercy of the market. The value of my $17 million apartment house is not based upon the price of the building. While price is important, I'm not counting on the price of the building going up due to some magical, unseen market condition. That is why the booms and busts of the markets do not concern me that much. The value of my apartment house is based upon the rent my tenants pay. In other words, the true value of the property is the value my tenants think the property is worth. If a renter thinks the apartment is a good value at $500 a month, that is the property's value. If I can increase the perceived value of my property to my tenants, I, not the market, have increased the value of the property. If I increase rents without an increase in perceived value, the tenant moves to the community down the street. The value of rental real estate, in this case my apartment houses, is dependent on jobs, salaries, demographics, local industry, and supply and demand of affordable housing. In a housing crash, the demand for rental units often goes up, which means demand and rents go up. If rents go up, the value of my rental real estate may go up, even if the value of residential real estate is coming down. There are three specific reasons why I'm not concerned about market crashes when it comes to the purchase of my 300-unit apartment house. One reason is because Tulsa, Oklahoma is an oil boomtown. High-paying jobs are plentiful. The oil industry needs workers, and transient workers need rental housing. The second reason is because a local college near the apartment house is doubling its number of students, but not the number of on-campus housing units, which increases demand for rental apartments. As many of you know, there is another baby boom, commonly referred to as the Echo Boomers, a generation just now entering college, which is 73 million strong. A majority of them will be renters. The third reason is because the fixed interest rate on the existing loan is very low. Low interest payments, lower expenses, and increasing income will increase property value, not market fluctuations. This means the 300-unit apartment house offers me both control and leverage. My job as an investor on this apartment house is to increase my leverage from 1 to 4 to possibly 1 to 10. That is, doubling the value of the property through operations, not the market. I can do this as long as I have control. Leverage is not risky. Many financial advisors will tell you that higher returns mean higher risk. In other words, leverage is risky. That is absolutely false. Leverage is only risky when people invest in assets that they have no control over. If a person has control, leverage can be applied with very little risk. The reason most financial advisors say that higher returns means higher risk is simply because they sell only investments that allow very little control. As mentioned above, my $17 million apartment house in Tulsa is a good investment to use leverage with because I have control over the operations, and the operations, that is, income collected through rents, determine the value of the investment. 
A house is not a good investment, and leverage is risky with a house because you do not control the value of the house. The value of a house is based on the market and the purchasing power of the currency it was purchased with. These things are out of your control. What is control? The major flaw in paper assets, such as savings, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and index funds, is the lack of control. And because you have no control, it is difficult and risky to apply leverage. Because these paper assets offer very little control, it is difficult to get a bank to lend you any money to invest in these assets. Financial intelligence is the key to control. Financial intelligence is the key to control. Financial intelligence increases control, and financial IQ measures the financial returns of financial intelligence. Take the 300-unit Tulsa apartment house as an example. Number one, the income column. The first step after acquiring the property is to increase the rent. The property is already profitable and cash flows with existing rents. In other words, I am already making money from day one. Even so, the objective or business plan is to raise the rent per unit to an additional $100 a month over the next three years by the following means. Raising the existing rents that are under market. Installing washers and dryers in all the units and charging extra for rent. Completing improvements to the property like landscaping and new paint. All of these can be completed by using the bank's money, not mine. When we provided the bank our business plan, these improvements were part of it and were factored into the total loan amount. Multiplying 300 units by $100 over three years, this increases the entire project's monthly income by $30,000 a month or an additional $360,000 a year. This increase in income is an example of control and leverage. If the plan works, three years from now, my financial IQ number four leverage will be infinite because the increase in income will be achieved by no additional capital from investors, just good knowledge of how to manage the asset control to higher and higher profitability. The increase in financial IQ is infinite because the increase in income will be achieved by using investor control and the bank's money. Number two, the expense column. The next controllable objective is to lower expenses. This is done in different ways. One specific example is by reducing labor costs through reduced administrative costs. Since we own other properties, many costs can be brought back to the main company. These are sometimes called back office expenses. They are the cost of accountants, bookkeepers, attorneys, and administrative staff. Other expenses that can come down are insurance, property taxes, water consumption, maintenance, and landscaping through better cost management and economy of scale. Also, expenses can be reduced and income can go up by keeping turnover low, the time it takes to re-rent an apartment. For example, the moment a tenant informs the management company that he or she is leaving, an ad is run advertising the apartment's availability. Once vacated, the cleaning crew comes in that day and the apartment is ready to show to a potential new tenant that night. And in many cases, an apartment is rented before the existing tenant even moves out. Obviously, many incompetent investors fail to reduce expenses and actually increase them, making the property a bad investment. Often they fail to manage the quality of tenants and the attractiveness of the property because they are trying to save money. In most cases, the property goes down in value. It's these poorly run properties that we like to buy because we can turn them into good investments through good property management. In other words, we make good money from bad investors. Property management is a key control. As you know, property management is one of the keys to profitability of real estate. Property management is a key control. Like most investors, I hate property management. That is why I have Ken McElroy, author of the ABCs of Real Estate Investing, as a partner. His company is absolutely the best. If you would like more information on property management or how to increase the value of real estate through property management, The Rich Dad Company offers several books and audio products created by my friend and investment partner, Ken, 
whose company is a leading property management company in the southwestern United States. One of the reasons why I stay clear of most stocks and mutual funds is because I have no control over expenses, especially management salaries, bonuses, and fees. It makes me sick to read about a greedy CEO's increase in pay even as shareholder value drops. Number 3. The Liability Column My 300-unit apartment house had an existing mortgage interest rate of just 4.95%. The low interest rate increases the asset value of the entire property. By adding a second mortgage at 6.5%, we created a blended rate of about 5.5%. 4.9% plus 6.5% equals 5.5%. This low interest rate is an important control and leverage. A percentage point on millions of dollars has a great impact on net income. For example, a 1% savings on a $10 million mortgage is $100,000 in extra income annually. Number 4. The Asset Column By increasing rents, reducing expenses, and reducing debt, or interest on debt, the asset value of the property increases. Before going on into higher forms of leverage and control, I believe it is important to recap and review the points covered so far before getting more complex. These are the seven points. Point number one, there are many types of leverage. The financial leverage most people are familiar with is the leverage of debt, that is OPM or other people's money. All five financial intelligences, which are increasing income, protection from predators, budgeting, leverage, and information, are forms of leverage. Leverage is anything that makes your job a little easier. It's easier to move a heavy object with a forklift, and it's easier to make a sophisticated investment decision with a higher financial IQ. Point number two. Most investors invest in paper assets, assets they have very little control over. Examples of paper assets are savings, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds and index funds. Because these assets allow little to no control, these investors have very little leverage and low returns on investment and reflect a low financial IQ. An example of low financial IQ is a 5% return on savings, paying taxes on that return, and then having inflation almost wipe out its value. Point number three, an increase in returns does not mean an increase in risk. When financial advisors say that an increase in returns means an increase in risk, they are right when speaking about paper assets. They are wrong when speaking for all assets. Assets, such as a business or real estate, require more financial intelligence, allow for more financial control, and permit a higher degree of leverage with very low risk. The key to low risk is higher financial intelligence. This is why I recommend that people start small and stay small as they allow their financial intelligence to increase. With an increase in financial intelligence, their returns on their investments increase. Point number four. Most financial advisors are not investors. Financial advisors are simply salespeople. Most financial advisors, even many real estate brokers, invest only in paper assets if they invest at all. Most have very little leverage professionally and financially. In many cases, their professional and financial leverage ratios are one-to-one. -one. A one-to-one -one professional ratio means they get paid for their work and only their work. A day's pay for a day's work. As a business owner, I have thousands of people working to assist me. As an investor, like in the example of the Tulsa apartment house, I have 300 tenants helping me pay for my investment, the bank lending me $4 for every one of my dollars, and the tax department giving me tax breaks on my income. These are examples of different types of leverage. Point number five. Financial education increases financial intelligence. Most people invest in paper assets, such as savings, stocks, bonds, and mutual and index funds, because they do not need or want control. All they want is to turn their money over to an investment advisor who hopefully does a good job, out of sight, out of mind. If people want more control, the first thing they need to control is their financial education, which increases their financial intelligence 
and hopefully increases their financial controls and leverage ratios. Point number six, leverage can work in two ways. Leverage can make you rich and leverage can make you poor. This is why leverage requires financial intelligence and financial controls. With stocks, a trader can use the leverage of options. If a trader thinks the market is going up, they may use a call option, which is the right to purchase a stock at a certain price within a certain time. If the trader thinks the market is going down, they may use a put option or short the stock. In other words, a trader has the potential to make money if the stock price is going up or going down. The problem, however, is that the trader has no control over the asset, just control over the terms of their trade. Learning to trade a market, even in real estate, is an important part of an investor's financial education. Real estate investors also use options. In real estate, a call option is known as a down payment. Since most of my investment in real estate is based upon rental prices and operating costs of a property, up and down markets in real estate do not affect me as much. While I do occasionally flip a property, especially if someone is willing to pay me a ridiculous price for it, as a practice, I would rather buy a property and collect rent and other income for a long time. Then I look for another property to buy and hold. Point number seven. When most financial advisors recommend diversification, they are not really diversifying. There are two reasons why the diversification they recommend is not diversification. The first reason is that financial advisors invest in only one category of asset, paper assets. As the market crash of August 9 and 10, 2007 revealed, diversification did not protect paper asset values. The second reason is that a mutual fund is already a diversified investment. It is a hodgepodge of good and bad stocks. Professional investors don't diversify. As Warren Buffett says, diversification is a protection against ignorance. Diversification is not required if a person knows what they are doing. Instead of diversifying, professional investors do two things. One is to focus only on great investments. This saves money and increases returns. The second is to hedge. Hedging is another term for insurance. For example, my 300-unit apartment house is required by the bank to have all sorts of insurance. If the property burns down, insurance pays my mortgage and rebuilds the building. Best of all, the cost of the insurance is paid out of the rental income itself. Two of the main reasons I do not like mutual funds is that banks do not lend money on them, and insurance companies will not sell me insurance against catastrophic loss if the market crashes. And all markets crash. On to more leverage, higher returns, and lower risk. Focus, not diversification, is the key to more sophisticated leverage, higher returns, and lower risk. Focus requires more financial intelligence. Financial intelligence begins with knowing what you are investing for. In the world of money, there are two things investors invest for, capital gains and cash flow. Number one, capital gains. Another reason so many people think investing is risky is because they invest for capital gains. When a person says, I'm buying this stock, mutual fund, or piece of real estate, he or she is investing for capital gains, an increase in the price of the asset. For example, if I had purchased the $17 million apartment house hoping I could sell it for $25 million, then I would be investing for capital gains. Number two, cash flow. Investing for cash flow is a lot less risky. Investing for cash flow is investing for income. If I put savings in the bank and receive 5% in interest, I am investing for cash flow. While interest is low risk, the problem with savings is the return is low. Taxes can be high, and the dollar keeps losing value. When I purchased the 300-unit apartment house, I was investing for cash flow. The difference is, I was investing for cash flow using my banker's money for a higher return on investment and paying less in taxes. That is a better use of leverage. What are you investing for? 
Most financial advisors recommend that a person invest in growth funds when he or she is young. Investing for growth is investing for capital gains. They advise older investors to then shift their growth funds into income funds or annuities. In other words, invest for cash flow when you are older. They believe cash flow is less risky and more certain. When it comes to capital gains or cash flow, there are three general types of investors. They are number 1. Those who invest only for capital gains. In the world of stocks, these people are called traders, and in the real estate market, they are called flippers. Their investment objectives are generally to buy low and sell high. When you look at the cash flow quadrant, traders and flippers are actually in the self-employed quadrant, not the investor quadrant. They are considered professional traders, not investors. On top of that, in America, traders and flippers are taxed at the higher self-employed quadrant tax rates and do not enjoy the benefits of the tax breaks the investor quadrant receives. Number 2. Those who invest only for cash flow. Many investors like savings or bonds because of the steady income. Some investors love municipal bonds because they pay a tax-free return. For example, if an investor buys a tax-free municipal bond paying 7% interest, the effective return on investment, ROI, is the same as receiving a 9% taxable return. Number 3. The Investor Who Invests for Capital Gains as Well as Cash Flow Years ago, old-time stock investors invested for both capital gains and cash flow. Old-timers still talk about the price of a stock going up as well as paying the investor a dividend. But that was in the old economy, the old capitalism. In the new capitalism, most paper investors are looking for the quick buck to make a killing. Today, the big investment houses are hiring the smartest whiz kids out of college and using computer models to look for the slightest market patterns they can exploit. For example, if the computer picks up a 1% differential, let's say in tech stocks, the investment house will bet millions of dollars hoping to gain 1% on millions of dollars in a few hours. This is very high leverage and very risky. These computer models also cause a lot of the volatility in the markets. When the stock market announces that program trading has been halted, it is talking about these computer programs being halted. The markets crash if the computers say sell. If the computers say buy, the markets boom, and then they crash. In other words, prices can go up or down for no fundamental or business reasons at all. A stock price may have no relationship to the value of the company because the computers created an artificial supply or demand. As an old-time investor in this new era of capitalism, I must be smart enough to invest for capital gains, cash flow, leverage of debt, and tax advantages, as well as be above the turmoil the whiz kids and computers cause in the marketplace. There are three components to being a good real estate investor. They are, number one, good partners. As Donald Trump says, you cannot do a good deal with bad partners. This does not mean bad partners are bad people. They may just be bad or wrong partners for you. For this 300-unit apartment house project to work, I must be sure I have good partners. Number 2. Good Financing Real estate is primarily a function of financing. Many people say, location, location, location. I say, financing, financing, financing. If you can secure good financing, the deal works. If you have bad financing, the deal will not. To illustrate my point, let's say the seller says, I want $35 million for my $17 million apartment complex. If the seller lets me finance the $35 million purchase price at $1 a month for 30 years with a balloon payment of $35 million at the end of the term, I would take the deal and give the seller the asking price. At $1 a month for 30 years, I can afford to pay $35 million for a $17 million property. As they say in the world of finance, I'll give you your price if you will give me my terms. Number 3. Good Management One of the reasons for my confidence in the $17 million 300-unit property is that I have good partners. Ken owns a property management company, 
and his partner Ross owns a real estate development company. In the following paragraphs, I will further explain how property management and development are essential to increasing rents, lowering expenses, and increasing asset value. Having control over these three components, good partners, good financing, and good management, I am more willing to use debt as leverage. Without control, I would probably not use debt financing. If there is higher risk, such as speculating in a stock or a commodity, I like to use only money I can afford to lose. Higher returns with less risk. I'm going to further explain my confidence in the investment thanks to my partners and having control over the 300 unit apartment project, why I am willing to use a lot of leverage, why I believe the risk is low, how I make more money, and how I pay less in taxes. There are three more advanced investment strategies, investment strategies that require a higher level of financial intelligence. The three advanced leverage strategies are OPM, ROI, and IRR. Number one, OPM, other people's money. There are many ways to use OPM. With the 300 unit apartment building, I am using 80% leverage. First of all, the beauty of using the bank's money is that it is tax free money. The other benefits of the bank's money are I keep the appreciation, cash flow income, tax benefits, and amortization. The bank puts up 80% of the money, but I receive 100% of the benefits. What a great partner! Number 2. ROI – Return on Investment A confusing concept for many investors is the return on their money, or ROI. For example, when you read financial publications, many mutual funds claim they have gone up by 10%. But my question is, did any of that 10% return to the investor? And how did they measure that 10%? Some funds measure the 10% by the price of the shares in the fund going up. For example, if a year ago the price per share in the fund was $10, and today it's $11, they can claim a 10% return. In this case, the return was measured in capital gains. As an investor who invests for both capital gains and cash flow, the only return I count is the cash flow. For example, if I invest $10 and each year after taxes I put $1 in my pocket from cash flow, my return is 10%. I do not count the return on asset appreciation because it is an estimate and does not become a reality unless I sell the asset. The difference is that one measure of the ROI is in the price of the stock, and the other measure of ROI is money in my pocket. I actually want both, 10% in asset appreciation and 10% cash in my pocket. But cash flow is the only return that can be tangibly measured while I hold the asset. More leverage, higher returns. The reason leverage is so important is because the higher the leverage, the higher the return. For example, if I buy a $100,000 rental unit with my money and I receive $10,000 a year net income, my cash-on-cash -cash return is 10%. If I borrow $50,000 and am still able to receive a $10,000 return, my cash-on-cash -cash return is 20%. If I finance the entire $100,000, and still receive a $10,000 return, my return is infinite. Infinite returns mean money for nothing. $10,000 flows into my pocket and nothing comes out. The renters cover my expense and I receive the income. Money for nothing. In my next example, again using the 300 unit apartment house, I will explain how I receive an infinite return by using leverage. The way this will be done is by raising rents and adding washers and dryers to each of the 300 units. The net $100 a month increase in rents is due to increased rents to match the competition, upgrades to the exterior, and fitting each unit with washers and dryers. 
This $100 a month increase in income is a 100% financed transaction. We get extra money from the bank to do the renovations. We have the control. The increase in debt is more than covered by our increase in income. This extra $100 is technically an infinite return because all the expense is fronted by the bank and all the returns come to me. The increase of $100 per month is multiplied by 300 units. This is an increase in gross income of $30,000 a month and $360,000 a year on top of the cash flow we are already getting. This $360,000 is an infinite return measured by cash flow in hand, not some fictitious capital gain on paper. In summary, the bank puts up 100% of the money for these improvements, and we receive the increase in income. The tenants pay for expenses and the mortgage. Number 3. IRR, or Internal Rate of Return One of the more complex, sophisticated, and often confusing measures of ROI is the internal rate of return. If investors really know what they are doing, they can increase their ROI by understanding IRR. In overly simplified terms, internal rate of return, IRR, measures the other returns and other leverage that a well-controlled investment can provide. The first example of IRR is passive income. Most people understand that gross rents are part of the income column. Yet IRR also measures other forms of income. Passive income is subject to lower tax rates than earned income. In the U.S., passive income is not subject to Social Security or self-employment taxes. In other words, these taxes do not show up as expenses in the expense column, which is technically a gain in income. The second example of IRR is depreciation. In the U.S., the tax department gives some investors an additional income that actually looks like an expense. This income is known as depreciation. Another term for depreciation is phantom income. The reason it is phantom income is because it's income that shows up somewhere else. For example, let's say my tax bill is $1,000. The IRS may allow me to depreciate my investment by $200, allowing me to pay only $800 in taxes. This additional $200 is phantom income or money I did not have to pay. It is $200 that remains in my pocket instead of going to the government. Depreciation is allowed for such things as refrigerators, ceiling fans, carpet, furniture, and other items that decline in value with age. A tax accountant can explain this to you if you own a business or real estate. There is no such thing as depreciation for paper asset investors. A third example of internal rate of return is amortization, which is a fancy word for paying off debt on a scheduled basis. When you have good debt, debt that someone else, such as a renter, pays for you, amortization becomes income to you. In other words, as a tenant pays down my debt, that payment is technically income to me, income that is paid to reduce my debt as my cash stays in my pocket, ready for the next great investment opportunity to come my way. Additionally, while my tenant is paying down my debt, I still receive all the tax benefits associated with my investment. A fourth example of IRR is appreciation. Appreciation is the increase in asset value. This is also income to you. This is not appreciation based upon some appraiser's idea of an increase in sales price based on comparative sales in the area. The way I measure appreciation is by the actual increase in income to my income column. For example, the increase of $360,000 in income from my 300-unit apartment house is measurable. This is not an exact method for defining IRR, but it gives you an idea how an investor can increase his or her return on investment far higher than most investors can receive from paper assets. At least, you have an idea of what an IRR is. I would guess 95% of investors have never heard of internal rates of return. So you are now smarter and sharper than 95% of the investors out there. The Exit Strategy The beauty of the exit strategy on the 300-unit apartment house is once again the use of leverage to become even richer. 
Instead of selling the property and facing substantial capital gains taxes on the profit, we pull out the money by refinancing. We are able to do this because we have increased the value of the property through our improvements in management. The bank recognizes this increase in value and we are able to borrow against it. By leveraging the property's value, we pull money out of the property tax-free and the improved operations more than cover the higher mortgage payment through higher income. By borrowing rather than selling, we get our down payment back tax-free and we get to keep the asset. At this point, the property's income is an infinite return because we have no money invested in the deal, yet we receive the income. This is the ultimate leverage. Let's say after five years we are able to refinance the property and pull out $4 million tax-free. The $4 million refinanced dollars go to the investors and pay back all initial equity and then some. Even better, we still maintain control over the 300 units and the increased mortgage payment of $280,000 is paid for by the $360,000 increase in income. The $360,000 increase in rental income minus $280,000 in increased interest expense leaves a net $80,000 in passive income. This $80,000 is an infinite return because the investors have received back their initial investment yet still receive cash flow. It is free money. The investors get $4 million back and move on to purchase another apartment house. This is an example of using control and leverage. This is an example of getting rich according to the rules of the new capitalism. Capitalism based on the use of debt to become richer. Rather than working hard to get out of debt, as those who follow the rules of old capitalism do, we work hard to find ways to get into more good debt and use more leverage. Starting with nothing. To some of you, a $17 million 300-unit apartment building sounds like a big investment. Ten years ago, buying a 300-unit apartment seemed big to Kim and me. Ten years from now, I am certain it will seem like a small investment. Kim, Ken, and I are already planning much bigger projects to take on. Donald Trump and I are looking at a massive project not far from my home, a project we will break ground on in ten years. I mention the size and dollar amounts of projects to make three points. Number one, being born poor and financially uneducated does not mean you cannot become rich. Very few people are born rich enough to buy a $17 million apartment complex, and no one is born smart enough to acquire, finance, and manage a 300-unit apartment complex by themselves. In other words, not having any money or financial education isn't an excuse not to get started. Number two, start small and take baby steps. In 1989, Kim's first investment was a $45,000 two-bedroom, one-bath home in Portland, Oregon. She put $5,000 down and made $25 a month. She was extremely nervous when she took her first step. Today, a $17 million apartment house is boring to her. She is ready for bigger projects. Number three, dream big. Most of us know that a child must be allowed to dream. The same is true for adults. As a couple, Kim and I have big dreams. Our dreams keep our marriage rich, young, and fun. Bigger investment projects keep us learning together, operating as a team, and growing together rather than growing apart. Instead of living below our means, we dream big, learn, and invest carefully in order to go beyond our means. It's not just about money. It's about life. In conclusion, on August 9 and 10, 2007, as the markets of the world crashed, many people had no idea what the crash meant. Most people have no idea how it will affect their lives. Most people have no idea how the rule changes back in 1971 and 1974 have affected their lives. Today, even in the richest country in the world, the U.S., millions of educated, hard-working people are earning less, even if they are paid more, saving money that is losing value, clinging to their homes as their value declines, and using credit cards to pay their bills. To make matters worse, because of a market crash, millions of educated, hard-working people think that investing is risky.
and to attain higher returns means you have to take on greater risks. There are only a few people who know that the key to leverage is control, and the key to control is financial intelligence. The good news is that the higher your financial intelligence, the more money you make without needing money. In this new capitalism, it is truly possible to make money for nothing. In the information age, knowledge is the ultimate leverage. The more money you make without money, the higher your ROI and IRR, and the higher your financial IQ. Chapter 7 Financial IQ Number 5 Improving Your Financial Information in January of 1972, I was transferred from Camp Pendleton, California, to an aircraft carrier off the coast of Vietnam. My primary job on board the carrier was as a helicopter gunship pilot. My primary mission was to fly as an escort for the larger troop helicopters. My secondary job was as an assistant to the squadron's top secret information officer. It was an extremely interesting job. For hours on end, we would sit, listen, observe, gather and process top secret information. At regular intervals during the day and the night, we gave briefings to the commanding officer and his team. Our job was to take raw data from the war and turn it into relevant information. As an information officer, I gained a tremendous respect for information. Prior to Vietnam, I never thought much about the subject. In school, I thought the study of information was a joke. To me, information was just data mindless facts and figures, dates and times to be memorized in order to pass tests. In Vietnam, information could mean life or death for my fellow pilots. Today, I believe that I am a better entrepreneur and investor because of my position as information officer. Today, I know that information can mean life or death in war and the difference between being rich or poor in business. While at war, the amount of information we had to process was staggering. Very quickly, we had to learn how to sort, categorize, discard, and process tremendous amounts of information from multiple and varied sources. To handle information overload, the military puts a great amount of effort into classifying information. Without classification, all information is equal and virtually worthless. As an information officer in Vietnam, I learned to classify information according to a set of characteristics. They are number 1. Time in war and in business, information can be useful one minute and obsolete the next. War is fluid, always moving. So is business and investing. Enemy troops can be one place today and a hundred miles away tomorrow. In business, a business advantage can be priceless today and worthless tomorrow. Number 2. Credibility We had to know who the information came from. Were our sources credible and reliable? Unfortunately, in the world of money, most people get their financial information from people they work with or salespeople. They may be good, honest people, but they are not credible or reliable sources of financial information. Number 3. Classification In the military, I learned to sort information into categories. For example, top-secret information was only available to those with top-secret clearances. In the world of business and investing, top secret or classified information is known as insider information. When the average investor hears the term, he or she thinks of illegal information, and sometimes it is. Insider information is illegal when a person receives information from someone inside a public company and uses it to buy or sell that company's shares. In reality, all information is inside information. A more important question is, how far from the inside are you? By the time a person hears a hot tip about a company's new product or news that a company is in trouble, people on the inside and close to the inside have already traded on that information. The battle has already been won, and the average investor has lost. Let me make it clear that I do not encourage or condone illegal insider trading. The distinction I want to make is about the importance of being on the inside and getting close to the information. One of the reasons I love being an entrepreneur and a real estate investor is because I am a legal insider who can trade on inside information. Since I am not a public company, I can also freely tell my friends what I know 
and how I am investing. One of the main reasons my rich dad encouraged me to develop my financial intelligence is so I could have access to inside information. The closer to the inside your information, the richer you become. Number 4. Relative Information Watching battlefield information change day by day, we as information officers were able to interpret past and present information to forecast future information. For example, if we knew that the enemy troops were in one position on Tuesday, another position on Wednesday, and another position on Thursday, we could begin to predict where they were going and what their objectives might be. In other words, we had to know how information related to other information. In the world of business and investing, this past, present, and future information gathering is known as watching the trends. Number 5. Deceptive Information In war, the enemy would often try to deceive us by sending deceptive information. They occasionally did this by using diversionary tactics. For example, they might move a large number of troops and equipment, making a lot of noise and dust just to distract us from their real motives and objectives or they allowed us to capture one of their troops who provided erroneous information. Business and investing are rampant with deceptive information. An entrepreneur and investor must be constantly vigilant and on guard. For example, many times a financial expert will tell you something and then do the opposite. This person may go on television and say he is bullish on a stock and is buying it. This bit of information causes other people to buy the stock, driving the stock price up. Once the price is up, the person who recommended the stock sells and takes a huge profit. This is known as the pump and dump. Classifying information to become richer. There are a number of lessons I learned in the military about classifying information that are applicable to business. Lesson number one, facts versus opinions. The key to military intelligence is to know the difference between facts and opinions. The same is true for financial intelligence. One of the reasons so many people think investing is risky is because they do not know the difference between facts and opinions. A few examples of opinions are, when someone says the shares of a company are going to go up, it's an opinion because it is about a future event. When someone says a person's net worth is a million dollars, it's an opinion, because most valuations are opinions. If a person says he is very successful, this is an opinion, because the definition of success is relative. Lesson number two, insane solutions. An insane solution occurs when a person uses information that is an opinion as a fact. In war, this can kill you. In business, it can ruin you. For example, question, why did you buy that house when you knew you couldn't afford it? Answer, I bought it because my broker said it was going to go up in value. I thought that I could buy the house, live in it, and then sell it for a profit, which would solve my money problems. Question, why do you invest in those mutual funds? Answer, because my supervisor told me to. She said it was a good investment. Lesson number three, risky actions. In war, if you didn't verify information and acted on it blindly, you risked death. A risky investor invests based on opinions. Unfortunately, this describes most investors. Since most investors invest for capital gains, their investment decision is based upon opinions about the future. Many investors invest in mutual funds based upon the opinion that the stock market goes up 8 to 10 percent per year. If the opinion is wrong, they lose. A smart investor knows the difference between facts and opinions. A cash flow investor invests for facts. If possible, a smart investor will invest using both opinion and facts and invest for both cash flow and capital gains. If you are investing in stocks, mutual funds, real estate, or business, ask yourself if the information you are basing your decision on is fact or opinion. Lesson number four, control over the asset. One important bit of information I want is how much control I have. In the previous chapter on financial IQ number four, leveraging your money, I stated that it was important to invest with control before leverage. 
If I do not have control, I do not use much leverage. I control my asset value by controlling my rents. My asset value is not based upon a market appraisal, which is an opinion 99% of the time. Lesson number five. What are the rules? Rules and laws are very important types of information. Many people get into trouble simply because they do not know the rules, ignore the rules, or break the rules. Personally, I never liked rules. In Vietnam, I liked them even less. One of the things I hated was that we fought according to one set of rules, and the enemy fought according to another. One rule I found ridiculous in war was the rule that we could not pursue the enemy across borders. The enemy would fight close to the border and then escape across it for safety. There were many times we had to break off a fight because the VC crossed back into Laos. It was my rich dad who changed my attitude towards rules. He said, if you play sports and there is no referee to enforce the rules, the game turns into chaos. If you drive on the highway and police do not enforce the rules, people die. This is why rules are important. Rules can make a person very rich or very poor. This is why information on rules is so important. For people who want to be rich, having good accountants and lawyers is important. Today, there are so many laws, rules, and regulations that it is impossible for any one person to know or understand them all. While hiring an attorney or accountant may seem expensive, the pain and money they can save and make for you can be much greater than the fees you pay them. Remember two things. Rules provide a valuable source of information about how the game of money is played, and without rules, assets decline in value. Lesson number six. Trends. A trend is developed when an investor takes information from a set of facts and then forms an opinion. Instead of diversifying, I prefer to focus on a few small assets, notice a trend, and invest with the trend. Since I know a trend can reverse and change direction, I do not blindly invest for the long term. Some of the trends I am investing in today are trends in oil. As you know, the more China, India, and Eastern Europe become westernized, the more the demand for oil goes up. Even with the rush to find alternative sources of power, oil will continue to be a primary source of power for years to come. As much as I do not like the environmental damage oil causes, the harsh reality is we all use it, even the most devoted environmentalists. I believe the long-term trend for the price of oil is up, possibly as high as $200 a barrel in the near future. This high price will have serious repercussions upon the world economy, which will later lead to other trends worth following as alternative energy technology, such as solar power, makes advances. Trends in Silver I believe silver is the best investment in 2007. I believe it is a better investment than oil. There are two reasons I say this. The first reason is because silver is a consumable industrial metal. This means it's used up. Silver is the metal of choice for electronics. It is used in computers, cell phones, television sets, and other gadgets. It is estimated that 95% of all silver is already consumed. It is becoming scarcer. Gold is different. It is estimated that 95% of all gold ever found is still around. Instead of being consumed as silver is, gold is hoarded. In many ways, this makes silver more valuable than gold. The second reason is because silver is also a precious metal, a form of money. As the dollar drops in purchasing power, more people will look for anything that represents real money or at least holds its value. As I write, silver is very cheap when compared to gold. It is approximately $13 an ounce, while gold is approximately $600 an ounce. Historically, gold has been only 14 times the price of silver, which means if silver were $10 an ounce, gold would be trading at $140 an ounce. At today's prices, gold and silver are trading at a differential of 50. To me, based on historical trends and the fact that silver is a consumable metal, it has a greater opportunity to go up in price. Trends in Housing One of the reasons I love investing in apartment houses is that rich or poor, people will pay for a roof over their head. 
In America, the population is expected to grow from 300 million to over 400 million in the next two decades. So I believe the price of housing will continue to trend up. As real estate becomes more expensive and difficult to afford, and as wages come down, I believe these trends will cause more people to be renters. One of the reasons Kim and I did not panic during the August 9, 2007 crash is because we rent out real estate for cash flow. We do not sell real estate. When the subprime mortgage market collapsed, sellers panicked. People who invested for cash flow, those who rent property to others, didn't panic. In fact, they saw opportunity. In down markets, there are more renters than buyers, so a crash is generally good for landlords, but not sellers. A final thought on trends is the importance of history and cycles. Having survived a number of up and down markets, I have learned a lot from history. There is one historical trend I believe is worth watching. That trend is the 20-year cycle between stocks and commodities. As a person who sailed for an oil company, I became curious about why the prices of commodities went up as stock prices came down. A few years ago, I came across a book written by one of my favorite financial authors, Jim Rogers, entitled Hot Commodities. Rogers discovered that stock prices went up for 20 years at the same time as commodity prices came down. For example, from 1960 to 1980, just as I was coming of age, commodity prices such as oil and gold were rising. In 1980, oil, gold, silver, and real estate prices came down rapidly as stock prices started climbing. Between 1980 and 2000, the stock market was the place to be, and oil, gold, and silver were dogs. While the commodity market was down, I was buying all the oil, gold, silver, and real estate I could. On schedule, in 2000, at the height of the dot-com boom, share prices dropped and commodity prices came roaring back up. If history repeats, this means that commodities will come down in 2020 and stocks will be the market to be in again. In conclusion, ultimately, it is not the asset that makes you rich. Information makes you rich or poor. In real estate, most investors lose money because of inadequate information and intelligence. That is why when someone asks me, is real estate a good investment? My reply is, I don't know. Are you a good investor? Chapter 8. The Integrity of Money Integrity is an interesting word. I have heard it used in many different ways and in different contexts. Many times I have heard someone say, he has no integrity. Someone else might say, that house has integrity of design. Before discussing the integrity of money, I think it best I give my definition of integrity. Webster's offers three definitions for integrity. They are, number one, soundness, an unimpaired condition. Number two, incorruptibility, firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values. Number three, completeness, the quality or state of being complete or undivided. All three definitions are required to discuss money and integrity. To better illustrate, I use the example of the integrity of an automobile. An automobile is made up of systems, the brake system, fuel system, electrical system, and so on. If the systems are not operating in integrity, the car will not be sound. The car is not whole. A similar example can be made with the human body. Some of the systems of the body are the respiratory system, nervous system, digestive system, and so on. If the integrity of the human body's system is not sound, corrupted with clogged arteries, for instance, health declines and disease or death soon follows. Just as health can break down from a lack of integrity, so can wealth be compromised by a lack of integrity. Symptoms of a lack of financial integrity are crippling taxes, high expenses, excessive debt, bankruptcy, foreclosure, sadness, and despair. Earlier, I listed five different financial intelligences. Once again, they are Financial IQ number one, making more money. Financial IQ number two, protecting your money. Financial IQ number three, budgeting your money. Financial IQ number four, leveraging your money. Financial IQ number five, 
improving your financial information. The integrity of all five intelligences is required if a person wants to grow rich, stay rich, and pass his or her wealth on for generations. Missing one or more of the financial intelligences is like someone who doesn't know how to drive attempting to drive a car that has brakes without pads and water in the gas lines. When a person is struggling financially, one or more of these financial intelligences is out of whack, financial integrity is not sound, and the person is not complete. A Reflection of Financial Integrity As my rich dad said, my banker has never asked me for my report card. The reason bankers don't ask for an academic report card is because they are looking for financial intelligence, not academic intelligence. This is why they ask for a financial statement. A financial statement is a reflection of your financial integrity. It is the equivalent of your financial report card. Bankers are looking for answers that relate to the five financial intelligences. Obviously, they want to know how smart people are at making money protecting their money, budgeting their money, leveraging their money, and how informed they are. A financial statement will give the bank the information it is looking for. Intrinsic Value Warren Buffett does not diversify. Instead, he looks for a company with intrinsic value, a company with financial integrity. He wants to know if the business has the five financial intelligences. In overly simplified terms, Buffett wants the answers to the following questions. Number one, can the business make more money? Number two, does the business have a protected niche? Number three, does the business budget its money and resources well? Number four, can the business be leveraged and expanded? Number five, is it run by a team of smart, well-informed people? In even simpler terms, intrinsic value means number one, niche. This means the business has a core competence, something that will make money in good times and bad. Coca-Cola fits this requirement. People will always drink sugared water regardless if plain water is better for them. A big advantage Coca-Cola has is its trademark, which is protected by law. You may recall that financial intelligence number two is protection. In this case, Warren likes this product because it's a product that is a legally protected brand, not just a commodity. A well-recognized brand, protected and defended from pirates, increases Coca-Cola's intrinsic value. The brand Rich Dad is a trademark, protected by law in every country we do business in. Being a brand gives my business greater intrinsic value. Many authors write books but fail to build a brand. As you know, Harry Potter is a mega brand. So is Donald Trump. If you are not a brand, you are a commodity. Brands have more intrinsic value, and to maintain this value, a brand must be true to its message and customers. A few years ago, a large mutual fund company approached me and asked if I would endorse its fund. Although the fee it would have paid me was very high, I turned the offer down. In my mind, endorsing a mutual fund would not be true to the Rich Dad brand. To me, it would have shown a lack of integrity, which would diminish the brand's intrinsic value. Number 2. Leverage This point separates the small business owners from the big business owners. For example, if I am a doctor, it is hard for me to leverage my value if my patients come only to see me. But if that same doctor invented a new cure or kind of medicine, then that doctor's medical intelligence can be leveraged via a product. The world is filled with small business owners and professionals who are not able to leverage because they are the product. Most employees fall into this category. Number three, expandability. Once a product or business can be leveraged, the next question Warren wants to know is, how far can the leverage be expanded? Warren loves Coca-Cola because its leverage is expandable throughout the world. Warren says, every time someone in the world drinks a Coke, I make a little money. When I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book was my leverage. Instead of my teaching in person, my book and my games could now do the teaching. The next task was to expand the product into different countries by printing the books and games in different languages. This was done by licensing the rights to produce Rich Dad products to businesses in different parts of the world. 
Instead of having my company print, inventory, and distribute my products, there are now publishers in 109 countries that do that for me. This is my example of leverage and then expandability. Number four, predictability. What Warren Buffett wants to know is how predictable revenue is. He doesn't want peaks and valleys in income. He wants to know that come rain or shine, the money will come in like clockwork. One of the reasons I love my apartment houses is that rain or shine, the money comes in. I'm not worried about the price of real estate going up or coming down. I want my money coming in 24-7 from all over the world and from my apartment houses. This is why Warren Buffett does not diversify. Instead, he focuses on a business's intrinsic value. Recognizing intrinsic value requires the five financial intelligences. When a business has intrinsic value, the business has integrity. When a business has integrity, it has a better chance to grow and remain profitable, regardless of changing economic conditions. Before investing in a company, a professional investor looks at the business's financial statement. The professional investor is looking for business integrity. The same is true when a real estate investor buys an apartment house. Knowing about the internal rate of return, IRR, is intrinsic value applied to real estate. The problem for most people, due to lack of financial education in school and not being able to read a financial statement, is that they don't know if the company or real estate they are investing in has financial integrity and intrinsic value. Chapter 9 Developing Your Financial Genius I didn't know I wasn't smart until I went to school. From kindergarten all the way through college, school was a struggle. I also didn't know I was poor until I went to school. When I was nine years old, my family moved across town, and I went to a school for rich kids. Interestingly, there were two elementary schools directly across the street from each other. On one side of the street was Union School. On the other side was Riverside School. Both were public schools. One school for the rich and the other for the working class. Originally, Union School was for the children of the sugar plantation union workers, hence the school's name. Riverside was the school for the children of sugar plantation owners and managers. I attended Riverside because the house our family lived in happened to be on the side of the street next to the river. Even though I was only nine, I was aware that my classmates at Riverside School lived at a higher standard of living than my family. Many of my rich classmates lived in an isolated community connected by a bridge across the river. Every time I crossed that bridge to play with my friends, I knew I was crossing into a different world. Although rich, my classmates and their families were not snobs. They were friendly people involved in the community. I spent a lot of time at my friends' beach homes, on their boats, and flying in their planes. They did not flaunt their wealth, they shared it. To them, being rich seemed natural, not special. It was a lifestyle and a standard of living. Their lifestyle was not that big a deal to them. It was I who thought their lifestyle was a big deal, sometimes feeling uncomfortable, sometimes out of place, and acutely aware of the standard of living that separated us. At the age of 12, my rich friends went off to private schools, and I continued on through public high school with the kids who went to Union School. In 1974, as I was getting out of the Marine Corps at the age of 27, I knew I wanted to be rich. Even though I had grown up, lost my baby fat, and gotten taller and stronger, in my mind, I was still the shy, fat guy without much money. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and invest in real estate, but I had no money and no skills. The more I thought about it and compared the life I wanted with what I had, the more I realized that my school teachers were correct. I was average. I had no great skills or talent. I was not smart. If I was going to be rich, I needed to find a way to be at least above my means in every way. Don't live below your means. Financial experts advise people to live below their means and diversify. To many people, this sounds like smart advice. The problem with following this advice is that you wind up average because it is average advice. It is not bad advice. It's just average financial advice. Besides, who wants to live below their means? I knew I needed to focus if I wanted a higher standard of living. 
a standard of living like my classmates who lived across the bridge. I decided the best way to beat the A students, the rich kids, the teachers who labeled me average, was to become rich. I was not angry with them. I was just tired of being average. I realized I could become richer than most people because when it came to money, most people were following below average financial strategies and advice. I built and rebuilt several businesses from 1974 to 1984. I was determined to become an entrepreneur. Just like a baby who stands and falls a number of times before learning to walk, I stood and fell a number of times before walking as an entrepreneur. From 1984 to 1994, I became an educational entrepreneur because I became interested in how people learn. Although I disliked school, I enjoyed learning. Also, I wanted to know why I always felt stupid in class. During those ten years, Kim and I built an education company that taught entrepreneurship and investing from our offices in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, and the U.S. During this period of time, I did things differently, almost the opposite of the way traditional schools teach. Instead of creating an environment where only one or two students were smart, I created an environment where everyone could feel smart and learn. Instead of competing, the class cooperated. Instead of having students listen to me lecture, I created different games to teach specific subjects. Instead of being bored, adult students were actively challenged and participated. I went on to develop my educational board game Cash Flow from what I learned as an entrepreneurial educator, the first game to teach both accounting and investing at the same time. As you may know, accounting can be the most boring subject on earth and investing the most frightening. By combining the two subjects into one game, learning became challenging and fun. A person could play the game a thousand times and still learn something new about accounting, investing, and themselves. The game was officially launched in 1996. As I learned more about the human mind and how we learn, I found out a number of things about our school system that were disturbing. I found out that our current system of teaching actually damages a child's brain. In other words, even an A student can be slowed up by the educational system. The more I studied and practiced different teaching techniques in my classes, the more I began to find the answers I was looking for and I found why I had constantly been labeled stupid or, at best, average. Multiple Intelligences Through my research, I discovered the book Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences by Howard Gardner. His book teaches that there are seven intelligences. Number one, linguistic. Number two, logical-mathematical. Number three, musical. Number four, bodily kinesthetic. Number five, spatial. Number six, interpersonal. Number seven, intrapersonal. His book validated what I intrinsically knew. I simply didn't have the intelligences recognized by the school system, which are predominantly linguistic and logical mathematical. This is one of the reasons I failed English twice in high school. I could not write, spell, or punctuate. I am not linguistic, and I am not logical. In my freshman year at the Merchant Marine Academy, English became my favorite subject because I had a great teacher. If not for that teacher, I might not be an author today. My English teacher at the Academy had great interpersonal skills, which is why he could relate to me. I respected him. Instead of talking down to me, he inspired me. We could speak person to person rather than teacher to student. In his class, I wanted to be smart, and I wanted to learn. Instead of another F in English, I received a B. Later, as a Marine in Vietnam, it was my intrapersonal intelligence that kept me alive. Intrapersonal intelligence is the ability to control my emotions and get the job done, even if the job is life-threatening. Many people are not successful financially because their intrapersonal intelligence is weak. People with limited intrapersonal intelligences often say, I need job security, or that sounds risky. These are examples of emotions doing the thinking, not intrapersonal intelligence. As I studied more about Gardner and his theory of multiple intelligences, 
I realized that the A students were those who had high linguistic and logical mathematical intelligences. Reading, writing, and math were easy for them, but very difficult for me. My intelligence strengths were spatial, bodily kinesthetic, and intrapersonal, which is why I doodled in class, built a boat, and was not threatened or motivated when teachers told me I wouldn't get a good job if I didn't get good grades. At this time, you may want to ask yourself, of the seven intelligences, which are you strongest at? Three Parts of the Brain Albert Einstein is credited with saying, imagination is more important than knowledge. As an entrepreneurial educator, I did a lot of research on the different parts of the brain. Boiling it all down to overly simplified terms, we have three basic parts to our brain. The left brain, the right brain, and the subconscious brain. The left brain is generally used for reading, writing, speaking, and logic. Kids who do well in school have well-developed left brains. From Gardner's work on multiple intelligences, the left brain would be most associated with linguistic, logical-mathematical, and interpersonal intelligences. Writer, scientist, lawyer, accountant, and schoolteacher are professions for such people. The right brain is the part of the brain often associated with pictures, art, music, and other more non-linear relationships with creativity and imagination. From Gardner's work, musical and spatial intelligences would be most associated with the right brain. Designer, architect, and musician are professions for people with these dominant intelligences. The subconscious brain is the most powerful of the three brains because it includes the old brain, often called the primitive brain. It's the primitive brain that is most like an animal's brain. It does not think but rather reacts, fights, flees, or freezes. From Gardner's work, the intrapersonal intelligence would most relate to the subconscious mind. In my opinion, it is a person's intrapersonal intelligence that ultimately determines if they are a success or failure in life, love, health, and money. This is because the subconscious mind is the most powerful part of the brain, especially in pressure situations. The subconscious mind also affects our bodily actions via bodily kinesthetic intelligence. For example, in the game of golf, pressure may cause a golfer to choke and miss an easy putt. Subconsciously, a person may freeze and not take action out of fear of making a mistake or stay at a job for security rather than the love of the work. People with high intrapersonal intelligence have the ability to control the subconscious brain's desire to fight, flee, or freeze. Instead of flee, they may decide the best thing to do is freeze. If frozen, they may choose to fight. The point is, they have the intelligence to choose the appropriate subconscious response. If angry, they can speak calmly. If afraid, they can confront their fear. People think differently when their subconscious is controlled by fear. If people are fearful, they may say, I can't do that, what if I fail? Or, that's risky. Compare that to a person who is in a fight state subconsciously who might say, I'll show them, I'll get that deal just to prove I can do it. Learning to choose your subconscious state of mind before thinking and making decisions is very important. When I was in Vietnam, I felt better, flew better, and was more confident when I subconsciously chose to fight. When I was in a fleeing or fearful state, my thoughts were fearful. So, choose your subconscious state of mind before using your left and right brains. Professions requiring tremendous control under stress are best for people with strong intrapersonal intelligence. For example, police officers, emergency room nurses and doctors, firefighters and soldiers require high intrapersonal intelligence. I would say entrepreneurs require a high level of this intelligence. Which brain controls your money? The reason I became curious about the brain and how it works is because I wondered why so many people say one thing and then do another. For example, I might ask a person, do you want to be rich? Most people will say from their logical left brain, yes, I really want to be rich. The problem is not found in their logical left brain. The problem is the subconscious brain saying, not you, you'll never be rich. Or how can you be rich? You don't have any money. 
In most cases, it's the subconscious fear of failing that holds people back. For example, I have a friend who is an attorney, an A student from Harvard, who wants to change, but he can't. He is afraid of doing something new for fear of failing and not making enough money. He says to me, I've been an attorney for so long, I don't know what else to do. Who else will pay me what I am earning? He has a brilliant left brain, an underdeveloped right brain, and an out-of-control subconscious brain. Again, the subconscious brain is the most powerful of the three brains. The subconscious mind is so powerful that it controls our addictions. For example, most smokers want to quit. You can logically explain to their left brain all the harmful effects of smoking and show their right brain horrifying pictures of lung cancer. But if the subconscious mind wants to smoke, the person smokes. In many ways, the subconscious brain controls your life, regardless if you are an A or F student. For most people, when it comes to money, there is a battle of the brains going on inside of them. It is this conflict that causes many people to live below their means, when in reality, they want to improve their standard of living and to be rich. The problem with traditional education is that it focuses on only one part of the brain, the left brain. In other words, you could be a left brain genius and a subconscious moron. You can know what to do in your left brain and in your subconscious brain be terrified of actually doing it. Worst of all, many people leave school fully able to read, write, and do math, but are terrified of failing and seek security instead of opportunity in the real world. They're taught to value knowledge over imagination and over the ability to integrate all three parts of the brain. After years of striving to be the best, these people are told by financial experts to diversify and live below their means. To a fearful subconscious brain, this advice sounds intelligent and logical. For years, these people then turned over a portion of their paycheck every month to their financial experts with the hopes that they know what they're doing. At the same time, the richest investor in the world, Warren Buffett, says, Diversification is a protection against ignorance. And it is. A world ruled by left-brainers. The world is run by left-brained people. The problem with left-brained people is they think there is only one brain and only one intelligence. Many are not aware of the other parts of the brain and the possibility of other types of intelligences. When you ask a highly educated left-brained person for the definition of intelligence, he or she replies, If you agree with me, you are intelligent. If you don't, you're an idiot. In the world of money, these left-brained people believe making money is a by-the-numbers formula, a mathematical equation. This is why when the market crashed, many funds crashed in unison. The funds are run by academic geniuses all following the same formula. Here's another quote from the August 24, 2007 Wall Street Journal article on quant funds. Justin Lehart, How the Quant Playback Failed. A number of quant funds, which use statistical models to find winning trading strategies, reported heavy losses this month. In many cases, the managers pointed their fingers at other quantitative hedge funds, essentially saying they all owned many of the same stocks and their models told them to sell at the same time, driving down the share prices, hurting everyone in the process. Learning to win using your whole brain Warren Buffett once said, You have to think for yourself. It always amazes me how high IQ people mindlessly imitate. As an educational entrepreneur, I began teaching students to think outside of the box and to create rather than imitate. I was surprised at how frightening this teaching process was for many of my students. Most had been so frightened into needing job security, a magic formula for investing, and avoiding mistakes that breaking the bonds of that fear was the hardest part of my job. These were smart, successful, well-educated people who wanted to make changes. Neuroscientists have recently discovered that the brain has mirror neurons. Many of these scientists believe this discovery is more important than the discovery of DNA. A neural mirror, in overly simple terms, is the equivalent of birds of a feather flock together. That is, our brains are programmed to imitate what we see others do. It explains why quant fund managers invest in the same stocks, why poor people stay poor even though they earn a lot of money, 
and why a child raised in England will speak a different dialect of English with a different accent than a child born in the U.S. or Australia. Mirror neurons of dialect and accent limit the scope of our world and who we associate with. Today, neuroscientists believe that mirror neurons are the most powerful learning parts of our brains. In the classroom, it explains why some students are teachers' pets. Since most classrooms are led by left-brained people, they tend to favor the kids with the same intelligences. In simple terms, mirror neurons mean our brains are like television transmitters and receivers. Even though we are not physically talking to one another, our brains are communicating at very deep levels. For example, when we walk into a room, most of us can immediately sense who likes us and who doesn't, even though nothing is said. This is the worst part. I learned that if I did not feel good about myself, people did not feel good about me. In many instances, another person is only sending back what I am broadcasting. In other words, if I think I am a loser, other people will think of me as a loser. The good news is that you and I can change their perception of us by changing our perception of ourselves. If I had not changed my perception of myself, I would never have met and married a beautiful woman like Kim. Someone like Donald Trump wouldn't be my friend, and I wouldn't be financially secure today. If I had not consciously changed my perception, I would probably still be a shy, fat, poor kid speaking pidgin English. Being raised in a family of school teachers, I realized their measure of success was the school a person attended and how many advanced degrees he or she had. In the world of big business, it was pretty much the same thing. In most major corporations, employers want the pedigree of prestige that comes with advanced degrees from recognized schools. Being around my rich dad, I realized his measure of success was how much money he made, the people he spent time with, the freedom to work or not work, and how many jobs he provided. I realized I had better decide whose measure of success I wanted to base my life on. Since I did not think I could win at my poor dad's game of school and big business, I decided I had a better chance of winning at my rich dad's game. That is when my real education began. I decided to follow in my rich dad's footsteps as an entrepreneur and real estate investor. The questions for you are, what is your measurement of success? Where do you have the best chance of winning? Is your brain being trained to win? Developing the three parts of the brain. For those of you who have played my cash flow game, you may recall that to win the game requires a lot of left brain financial knowledge and right brain creativity. Since it is only a game being played with fake money, the fear of failing or losing money is greatly reduced, leaving the subconscious mind more or less neutral. Once a person understands the game, the subconscious brain shifts from fear to excitement and the joy of winning. Learning becomes fun and exciting. All three brains are being educated and developed. New possibilities are opening for an expanded whole brain. In 2005, Arizona State University did a study on the viability of my game for teaching accounting and investing to business school students. Their findings were extremely positive, concluding that students actually learned faster and retained knowledge longer than when they learned in other ways. One great success story occurred recently at a boys and girls club in a very poor part of Phoenix. A team from my company set up a cash flow club. Once again, teaching financial intelligence via a game was powerful, profound, and life-changing. One particular participant was a student who was labeled learning disabled by the school system and placed in a class for slow learners. After playing the cash flow game a number of times with his friends, he slowly began to improve his reading and math skills. Today, he's in a regular class. This is the power of coordinating all three parts of the brain in a cooperative peer-to-peer -peer learning environment. Finding Your Genius For people to develop their genius, they need to find the environment that supports the development of their genius. For example, Tiger Woods' environment is the golf course. He would not have done well as a jockey. Donald Trump found his strength in the tough world of New York real estate. That environment challenged him, taught him a lot, and developed his skills. 
As you know, Tiger Woods works very hard at being a golf genius. Donald Trump works very hard at being a genius at real estate development. One of the reasons many people do not develop their genius is simply because they are lazy. Many just go to work to collect a paycheck. It is easier for them to be average than to work hard at developing their genius. My questions to you are, what do you think your genius is and what environment is best for you to develop it? Another important question is, do you have the courage to change environments? Imagine your future if you did. In summary, financially weak people are people who tend not to develop their intelligence. They seek easy environments and easy answers. These are people who pay too much in taxes, work hard, and live below their means. They may be smart, good, and academic, but without the financial development of all three brains, they will most likely remain weak financially. Success requires some degree of mental and physical toughness. If you can train your left brain to understand the subject, engage your right brain to come up with creative solutions, keep your subconscious brain excited rather than fearful, and then take action while being willing to make mistakes and learn, you can create magic. You can develop your genius. Thank you for listening to this audiobook.